The chair knows that the chair knows the time is 6:01. I call this meeting of the Amersoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge, as ZBA chair. I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with the roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows here. Mr. Everell Henry here. Mr. David Sloviter here. And Mr. John Warner here. Quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Ms. Christine Brestrup, Planning Director, Rob Mora, Building Commissioner, and Jacinta um, Williams, excuse me, Jacinta Williams, Planner for the Town. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40A, Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw. This public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff, and they may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen or by pressing star nine on their phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project, input from the public, is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition is heard by the, heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a public, for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed with the, in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body and superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, consideration of the minutes from June 27th, a public meeting on um, ZBA 2006-15, Frank Patel, 15, oh, we're going we're gonna to do this second. We're first going to hear from Carol and Murray. Uh, and we're going to spend about an hour talking about the 40B process, uh, comprehensive permit training for our staff and for our, us as members. Second, we're ZBA 2006, 15 Frank Patel, 15 Hazel Avenue, in accordance with conditions of number six of the FY 2006-15 special permit, the new owner shall appear before the ZBA to review and accept the existing management plan for property located at 15 Hazel Avenue. Map 13D, Parcel 32, RN, Neighborhood Residence Zoning District. And this is continued from July 25th, 2024. And then a public hearing starting around 7.30, ZBA FY 2025-03, Amherst Development Associates, request for a special permit under sections 9.22, non-conforming uses, 3.326 for fraternity or sorority building, social dormitory, or similar use related to Amherst College, Hampshire College, or the University of Massachusetts to alter a pre-existing non-conforming use 
Hotel Motel to a social dormitory on the premises located at 345 North Pleasant Street, Map 11C, Parcel, two, parcel 250 in the RG General Residence Zoning Districts. Following that, there's a general public comment period on any matter not before the board tonight and um, new business or other business not anticipated within the past 48 hours. So tonight, um, before we start, I first want to um, acknowledge some uh, news that I did not receive happily, but I am happy for the person that made that news, and that's Ms. Chris Bresper. Um She gave notice that, I, that she's going, going to be um, retiring from full-time work with us, and she's done that for over 20 years, uh, serving the town, particularly the town, the, particularly the planning department, the planning board, as well as the ZBA, and a host of other functions. Um, she's been a re she really has provided tremendous service to this town. And those 20 years you have made, in those 20 years, you've made quite a mark here, Chris. So we'll have more time. It's not, you're not going to be um, taking on other responsibilities before for two months. So we'll have, a, we'll have the ability to see you and, and celebrate you appropriately. But I wanted to acknowledge um, that what you let us all know and acknowledge the hard work that you've done for some such a long time. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. You bet. Um, may I mention that um, Hilda Greenbaum is in the attendees list and she would like to be let in as a panelist if that's appropriate. Other members, other um, associate members are here as panelists as well. I think we've got, do we have any Hilda? Uh, there she is. Rizwina? I think we have everybody that, um, yep, I think we've got everybody except Mr. White who couldn't be here. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. All right. The first order of business tonight is a consideration to approve the minutes from Thursday, July 11th. Um, I was not at this meeting, but I have reviewed the minutes and they seem to make a lot of sense. Have other people um, reviewed the minutes and do they have any changes or suggestions? All right. If there's no changes um, to the minutes, I would entertain a motion that we approve the minutes for the, uh, of the meeting of Thursday, July 11th, 2024. Um, and that will be with the, the, uh, the permanent members of the, of the ZBA voting on that. So four members. So, so moved. Oh, so moved. Is there seconded. a second? And moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, the chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. <clears throat> motion is, uh, the vote is four to nothing. The motion carries, the minutes are approved. Uh, the next order of business is um, a discussion with Carolyn Murray with the KP Law Firm. Carolyn um, has been tremendous help in the 40B process in the last couple ones we've been through. Um, and I think she's guided us, not only guided us, but provided a lot of insight and uh, a lot of staff work that really helped us complete the work, especially on the, uh, the 32 North, 132 Northampton, and then the, uh, the project that we just recently completed. So uh, Carolyn, you're going to go through and talk a little bit about the 40B project, which is a process, which is really different than our normal special permit process. And I think for members who have not been on a comprehensive permit panel before, this is going to be um, important for you to know, um, even though I think for this panel, it's probably this subject, it'll be the full members. I think um, for the other members, this is uh, who not be, will not be serving on this specific panel. This will be really helpful um, to learn about how this process differs from the uh, normal special permit process. And it gives you an insight into the normal special permit process uh, by contrast. So Carolyn, thank you so much. Um, Attorney Murray, we really we appreciate your work and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank Just you. give us your name and address for the record. I forgot to ask. Certainly. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Carolyn Murray from KP Law in Boston, um, serving as your town council. And um, I believe Jacinta is going to help us with a, a PowerPoint presentation this evening. Um, I, I know that, you know, it was only about a year or so ago 
that we did a 40B training. I know we've had some uh, new members, you know, join the board, um, but this was designed to be a refresher, not necessarily going down um, every possible rabbit hole that we could. Um, and I know you've got other things on the agenda tonight, Mr. Chair. So I, I guess I would say as we go through the slides, if there's anything on the particular slides that don't make sense, or if I say something that is confusing, please feel free to interrupt and, and clarify, but maybe we hold uh, broader questions for when the presentation is, is over. Does that seem to make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So clarification questions during the presentation, broader questions at the end of the presentation. Great. Except I, I will then take 10 seconds to say, Christine, I'll be sad to see you go. <laughs> um, and I, so. to, the, to our alternate members, please feel free to participate in this discussion. Okay. So I think Jacinta, we could sort of uh, skip ahead a couple. Um, perfect. I mean, this is our you know general disclaimer that uh, we've got to be mindful of the fact that everything that you consider as a board, you do so in the context of a public hearing. So you might have some questions tonight about a particular project. Um, we really shouldn't talk about a specific project. We should um, limit ourselves to just generalities or hypotheticals um, because uh, we don't want to impact the outcome of those other public hearings this evening. So just as a, a, a quick introduction to Chapter 40B, also called the Comprehensive Permit Statute, um, as, as the chair was saying at the outset, this is something unlike anything else that you will handle as a zoning board member. Um, as its name implies, it's a comprehensive permit, meaning it's supposed to be one stop. And that one stop at the local level is the Zoning Board of Appeals. So the Zoning Board is going to act in place of all other local boards with respect to this comprehensive mm -hmm. permit project. So you will find yourself in some cases uh, weighing in on things that perhaps the planning board does, such as in the form of an ANR plan or a subdivision. Um, you may find yourself um, handling some matters that uh, might be uh, unique to or usually handled by just uh, the conservation commissions or the board of health. But the one caveat to that is you don't exercise any particular authority under state law. So when I say that you might handle some issues uh, for the Board of Health, for example, uh, the Board of Health, as we know, administers Title V for septic systems. If an applicant needs uh, a septic system and they, have, uh, they need a permit under Title V, they're still going to go to the Board of Health. But if the B Board of Health has local regulations pertaining to septic systems that might be more restrictive, those local regulations are all gonna be something that is considered as part of the board's decision. Same thing with the Conservation Commission. There might be certain aspects of the State Wetlands Protection Act. They will still have to go to the Conservation Commission for, but if we have a local bylaw <laughs> that is specific to Amherst and wetlands, then that's all gonna come through uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals in this process. So you might sometimes find yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone, shall we say, when it comes to some of these projects. Um, something else that folks uh, often ask about is, um, you know, comprehensive permits. Because they include market rate as well as affordable units, developers are often uh, need to offset their costs of development um, and one way that they do that is they ask for greater density. So it is not unusual um, for them to come in and request a higher density than any bylaw that uh, the town has may allow. They can also come on in and ask to locate um, an affordable housing project in a zoning district that wouldn't normally allow for say a multifamily development. So. 40B basically takes everything that you understand about zoning and kind of tips it on its head um, and allows the zoning board this broad discretion to waive anything that you feel 
is in the best interest of promoting affordable housing. So we could go to the next one, please. Your standard when you're uh, reviewing and, and issuing decisions on comprehensive permits um, is this term of art that the regulations use that it's called consistent with local needs. So as you know, when you're acting on a variance, you're always looking at shape, soil, and topography and a, and a hardship. Here in a 40B, you are looking at whether or not um, the issuance of the, of the permit would be consistent with local needs. And that is something specifically defined in the regulations and the statute as meaning something that it um, there has to be a local rule and that local rule could be a bylaw regulation, something else. That local rule has to be based in public health, safety, um, and somehow or other that local rule either needs to be consistent with the broader goal of Chapter 40B, which is to generate affordable housing, or it is um, uh, you know something that you would use perhaps to deny um, a comprehensive permit because we feel that there is a local rule that is so important that it outweighs the regional need um, for affordable housing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about safe harbors later because um, Amherst does enjoy one, so I'll I'll go through that in another slide or two. Um, one other thing that that the board needs to keep in mind when it's uh, issuing a decision on a comprehensive permit is we have to make sure that we are applying the rules evenly to subsidized versus non-subsidized projects. And what do we mean by subsidized? A comprehensive permit or an affordable housing project is a subsidized project. That subsidy might come in the form of state aid, uh, you know, financial aid, it might be technical aid, but that's what we mean by um, a subsidized project. So we have to make sure that the 40B isn't being treated any differently from say a pure market rate development that would come in um, for you know similar scale and size. So some of the safe harbors um, and what does safe harbor mean? Uh, safe harbor is one of the tools available to the town under 40B where a town can say, you know, put up their hand and literally say stop to more affordable housing if they so choose, if we have achieved one of the various types of uh, safe harbors that the statute recognizes. We've all heard the 10% rule. Um, Amherst has exceeded its 10%, so it is in a safe harbor situation. There's also uh, a 1.5% of the town's general land area safe harbor. If we had 1.5% of our total land area devoted to affordable housing, we'd have a safe harbor. There are also some safe harbors available if um, we have recently entertained what they consider to be a large scale project, or if there had been a related application on that had that dealt with the same pro the same parcel of land and had a residential component to it. Um, usually what this means is if you had a subdivision that was denied and then the developer said, well, you know what? Um, I'm gonna come back in and I'm gonna do a 40B and I'm gonna do it at a higher density than that subdivision was. The developer has to wait 12 months from the denial of that subdivision before they could file uh, for a comprehensive permit. So it's a one year safe harbor. Also, um, if the town has a certified affordable housing production plan, that housing production plan usually has certain goals. And depending upon how many housing units we might add in a given uh, period of time, the town could also achieve either a one year or a two year safe harbor in that time period. If we are going to assert a safe harbor, um, or what does it mean to assert a safe harbor, as they said, the town could, if it chose, deny a comprehensive permit if we assert a safe harbor. We don't have to deny it, but we have the ability to deny it. And if we were to deny it, the applicant has no recourse, meaning they have no avenue of appeal. 
Um, just because we are in a safe harbor, we can still go ahead and we can still proceed and hear uh, the comprehensive permit. And let's suppose we decide to approve it with conditions. The applicant still has no right to appeal any of those conditions um, as a result of us asserting the safe harbor. And there is a, a time period associated. If we could go to the next slide, Jacinta, please. Thank you. There is um, a, 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 a sensitivity to the time with respect to when you assert safe harbor. It's something that we, we have to assert right out of the gate. So the minute we receive um, a comprehensive permit application, we have to open the public hearing within 30 days of receipt of that application. We then have 15 days to notify the applicant in writing if we are going to assert a safe harbor. Um, if we do decide to assert the safe harbor, um, the, that decision, uh, I suppose the applicant were to disagree with us, for example, the applicant could appeal that to um, the Housing Appeals Committee. And if the Housing Appeals Committee agrees with the developer that um, you know we are not in a safe harbor, we would actually have like an interlocutory hearing um, that would put the comprehensive permit time periods completely on hold while that interlocutory appeal um, is heard. And if at the end of it, the Housing Appeals Committee decides that we have not proven that we're in a safe harbor, then the application comes right back to the ZBA and you pick up as though nothing had ever happened. You pick up with whatever time periods are remaining for completion of the public hear hearing on the application itself. Now we often hear something called a friendly 40B and Amherst is certainly no stranger to friendly 40Bs. A friendly 40B is basically um, um, a comprehensive permit application that is filed under what's called the local initiative program or you might hear people refer to LIP applications. And basically what it means is that before a developer ever um, even starts the process of seeking state permission um, to proceed with, a, with a, an affordable housing project, they'll come to the town first and ask the town to partner with them and the ask the town to actually sign off on the application. It's usually an opportunity for the town to sort of express some of its concerns about the impacts of the development. It's also an opportunity to negotiate perhaps some mitigation um, or set some ground rules about the, say maybe the number of units or whether we want them to be rental units or we want them to be ownership. Um, but once the town signs off on the application, it goes through the exact same process that any 40B does. It goes into what we call the subsidizing agency, which is usually a state agency that's offering some form of financial or technical support to the developer. They're gonna do a, a site analysis and eventually they're gonna issue something that's called a project eligibility letter. I think we have some slides coming up on that. There we go. So the project eligibility letter is literally a developer's ticket to proceed to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So the developer starts with the subsidizing agency at the state, submits all of their, um, their financial information, they submit their concept plan. Um, there's a comment period for the town to weigh in on that, as to, again, in terms of any concerns or impacts. But once the agency decides that they think that this is a fundable project, they issue a project eligibility letter, which then allows the developer to come and file their application with the Zoning Board of Appeals. There's a couple of criteria that they that the developer has to establish in order to get their project eligibility letter. One is that they have to either be a public agency that, or a nonprofit, or they have to be a limited dividend organization, or they have to indicate that they are willing to create a limited dividend organization 
before any project um, would be allowed to be constructed. They also have to prove that it's fundable. Um, and that's, again, something that the subsidizing agency um, analyzes. And they have to have control of the site where they plan on developing the project. Control of the site doesn't mean they have to own it. It could be something that's subject to a purchase and sale agreement. It could be a long-term lease. But those three criteria that if they're satisfied, those are things that are entirely within uh, the determination of the subsidizing agency, and they are not appealable. Meaning, sometimes I hear when the project eligibility letter is issued, um, you know, in the, the comprehensive permit application is filed, a zoning board will sometimes question whether or not the applicant satisfies these criteria. Um, those are things that are not within your purview. So um, it's not a basis for us to not consider. You know, once that project eligibility letter issues, we accept that as um, basically prima facie evidence that the, um, the applicant has qualified. Um, I think we just covered the contents on this slide. So if we could skip ahead to the next, please. Great. Um, so once the, the project eligibility letter is filed, the applicant will file their application with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Now, normally the Zoning Board has um, some advance notice that a 40B is coming. You know, it doesn't just show up out of the blue one Monday morning and take us all by surprise. We've had some notice and comment periods prior to that. It's always a good time for the zoning board to look at their comprehensive permit regulations, if they have any. If you don't have any, it's always a good time to consider adopting some. Um, because once the application is filed, the applicant is subject to whatever rules are in place on the date of that application. So if we were planning on updating our, our permit uh, regulations for the purposes of, let's say, you know, suppose we still had an outdated filing fee of, you know, $20 or something like that. And we've been talking about increasing it for years. If we haven't actually done that by the time the application is filed, we're locked in with that $20 application fee. The application fee has got to be paid in full at the time of the application um, in order to proceed. So when the application comes in, one of the things that is uh, going to be near and dear to the zoning board's hearts is what's called a waiver list. The applicant is required to submit a waiver list. Um, and it might be revised from time to time because as the project, um, as the proponents receive comments and feedback from the board and other departments, there might be certain waivers that are added or waivers that are discovered might not be necessary. Um, but the waiver list is, is essentially like the list of variances that they're asking for from the board, meaning all of the various types of, of provisions of your local bylaws or regulations that the applicant is asking for permission to not have to comply with. Um, and this could be everything from procedural aspects, um, such as we won't submit them to site plan review by the planning board because everything comes to the ZBA, or it could even be, you know, dimensional waivers. Um, you know, if they need to exceed your height limitation, for example, in order to get the requisite number of units in, um, all of that will have to be voted on by the board as part of its decision. Um, okay, so then once we get underway uh, with public hearing, the process follows the same um, notices as you, you're accustomed to under Chapter 40A in terms of who gets notified and how long you have to advertise. But what is different is the timetable. It's supposed to be a more aggressive timetable. So ordinarily, um, an application would come into the Zoning Board of Appeals and you'd have 65 days before you'd have to open the public hearing. For 40B, you have to open that public hearing within 30 days. Um, you also have to close the public hearing within 180 days of when you open it. So it's always very important. I know I always try to keep track of, uh, keep a running uh, tally of, of the number of meetings because 
you know, these types, these hearings often go on or span several months. And that six months can go by very quickly and take you by surprise. So it's always important to keep your eye on what is the 180 day maximum so that um, we can be sure to get an extension from the applicant as needed. Um, and I always suggest to boards that, you know, applicants are always very quick to ask us for a continuance when their engineer is not available or the plans aren't quite ready yet. And I always suggest that grant them those extensions, but when we're granting them an ex a continuance on their end, I want the same amount of time tacked on to the ZBA's timetable on the 180 day end so that if, if they delay things for 60 days, we're gonna get 60 more days added on for the time for us to act. And I and usually developers are pretty uh pretty good at complying with that. They understand that. Why does this matter? The most important thing is obviously we want to avoid constructive approval, meaning if we don't act in time um, and the clock runs out, that comprehensive permit is deemed approved and we have no recourse other than to fight the constructive approval. Also, something totally um, foreign to zoning boards of appeals is that a comprehensive permit decision, including votes on waivers, only requires a majority vote of the board, as opposed to your usual supermajority. Um, the public hearing, once you've actually closed the public hearing, the board has 40 days to deliberate, um, but you have to actually render or take a vote within 40 days of closing the hearing. Again, you could extend that deadline by agreement with the applicant. Once you've actually voted on your decision, you have 14 days to file your written decision with the town clerk. And a copy of the decision has to go into the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, formerly known as the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, we can go to the next one, please. So one thing that's important to consider during the public hearing process is the use of outside consultants. Um, there's a statute, Chapter 44, Section 53G, that authorizes the zoning board to hire third-party consultants for any kind of technical review that the board feels they need to help, help them analyze and um, review the project. So we often see the zoning board um, hiring, for example, a traffic peer review consultant, perhaps stormwater, um, might just be civil engineering. Sometimes there's even like a landscaping or design architect that is engaged. And those people, those peer reviewers, those are your representatives to provide feedback to the board. And I find that they often not only just identify potential issues or identify um, some ways in which the applicant perhaps um, has not complied with a local requirement, but they also help us formulate conditions of approval that can be important. Um, the applicant has to pay for that consultant entirely. Uh, so that's the beauty of it, or one of the one of the few benefits, I guess, that a municipality gets under the 40B statute. Um, the applicant doesn't really have any right to challenge who we select as a peer review consultant with two exceptions. If, if we choose a peer review consultant who has done prior work for the applicant or has done prior work on the very project that is before you, um, that person is disqualified, that firm is disqualified as having a conflict of interest. Or if the applicant claims that our peer review consultant doesn't have the necessary qualifications to review whatever it is they're being asked to review. So for example, you might have a peer review consultant, like an engineering firm that you work with, but they might not have an in-house traffic engineer. So you might actually need um, to reach out to someone else to bring in uh, the traffic peer review to make sure that they're qualified to do so. So as, as I said earlier, you know, the standard here is whether or not um, the 
approval of an affordable housing project is consistent with local needs. And there's always the balancing test and whether that whether the affordable housing need outweighs any sort of requirement under a local bylaw. Um, you know, I don't think this is surprising to anyone, uh, but there is a very strong presumption in favor of housing, particularly affordable housing in, across the Commonwealth, as we're certainly seeing from uh, last week's legislation. And, um, you know, that comes through with appeals that folks have um, with the Housing Appeals Committee that um, I, I don't ever want to put rose-colored glasses on it. it. It the victories for municipalities in these cases um, are few and far between. There are a couple that have happened, but I I'm not kidding when I say there have only been really a couple. By and large, um, if if a local board denies a comprehensive permit, they are overturned by the Housing Appeals Committee in the end. So we always want to be in a position of, or I recommend, if we actually approve a comprehensive permit, you approve it with conditions and you get to shape the project a little bit. If we flat out deny a project and there's an appeal and we ultimately lose on appeal, the Housing Appeals Committee is not going to be quick to include some of the protections that the zoning board would normally have asked for in a decision. There certainly isn't going to be any mitigation. So sometimes there is a strategy to approving that decision rather than a, a denial. Some of the reasons why you could deny um, or you could find a local rule could um, overcome the need for regional affordable housing. Um, it could be things such as there's a health and safety issue. Um, there's a, a lack of open space. And this is a multifamily development where we expect to get families and we expect that they're going to be able or, or should be able to enjoy open space and recreational areas, things of that nature. As I said earlier, you've got to apply the requirements equally to a subsidized versus an unsubsidized project. Um, and obviously where the, you're allowed to literally waive all of your zoning requirements if, uh, if that's what was presented to you, um, we can't deny a project because they don't conform to a local bylaw unless of course we have proven that that local bylaw satisfies a local need um, that outweighs the need for, for affordable housing. I think I already com commented on that for about the peer review. Conditions, um, I, I spoke a little bit about this, you know, conditions, how important those can be in um, a decision but there's also something unique to a 40B about what's called uneconomic conditions. Meaning if a condition imposed by the Zoning Board of Appeals um, in the opinion of the developer would render the project to be economically impractical or not feasible, the applicant can challenge the condition. So you might have approved comprehensive permit but they can still appeal that decision based on one of the conditions rendering the project uneconomic. Um, and there's a whole separate financial uh, analysis that would have to go into proving that it's uneconomic to them. Um, and we would likewise have to get our own uh, experts to testify to that. Um, I mentioned that the applicant can appeal um, decisions to the Housing Appeals Committee and when we say other aggrieved persons, meaning abutters, abutters can appeal to superior court or to the land court. So it's a slightly different avenue of appeal. Comprehensive permit decisions can be modified. There's a specific process in the regulations as to how to modify them. The board has 20 days from receipt of a modification request 
to meet and determine whether or not it's a substantial modification or an insubstantial modification. If we find it's a substantial modification, we have to notify the developer and we have to schedule a public hearing within 30 days following the same notice requirements um, as the full-blown comprehensive permit requires. If it's an insubstantial modification, um, the board can approve it at a public meeting um, or the board could take no action on it and uh, it's going to be considered automatically incorporated into the board's decision. I always prefer that the board act and affirmatively approve these things um, so that we have that paper trail on modifications, but there are instances where a board has um, chosen not to act and the modification takes effect anyway. Um, and these terms substantial and insubstantial modification, there is some guidance in the regulations as to what normally is substantial versus insubstantial. Every now and then we get something that is a little bit different and it requires a little bit of um, thought and discussion with the Zoning Board of Appeals as to whether or not you really feel it is a, uh, a substantial modification. Um, either way, you're going to issue um, a written decision and it gets recorded and um, you know becomes part of the comprehensive permit decision itself. And that is it. So I'm happy to entertain any questions you might have. So Ms. Murray, um, if we, since we are a safe harbor community, do those, when, when do those appeals apply to us? So I, when, do, when does the appeal to the housing, I forget the name of it, the Housing Appeals Committee, I guess it is. When do those appeals apply to us as, even if we assert um, safe harbor? So we have, uh, if we, right at the very beginning, you know, within 15 days of when we open the public hearing, um, we should certainly assert safe harbor and send a notice to the developer. That safe harbor notification can say one of two things. It can say, we are in a safe harbor, and based on that safe harbor, we hereby deny your comprehensive permit, and we are done. Or we can do what we did with the last um, applicant that came before us, where we said, we are in a safe harbor, but we are still willing to entertain this particular project. But the applicant is now put on notice that if we approve this application with conditions, or if we ultimately hear it and decide we're going to deny it, that the, the applicant cannot appeal um, that determination. So within you know, we've got to notify the developer within 15 days of, of our assertion of the safe harbor. The developer then has an equal amount of time to decide whether or not they're going to challenge that safe harbor and first, it would have to go a notice that would have to go into the executive office of housing and livable communities. And the executive office of housing and livable communities would write back saying whether or not they agreed with Amherst or not. So, for example, we all know your your subsidized housing inventory exceeds ten percent, but let's suppose we had a developer out there who thought, no, no, no. Um, you've actually lost some units or maybe because of additional market rate units or because of, um, you know, a change in the census. If they were to challenge our 10%, it would then be up to housing, the housing and livable communities to verify that we are at or exceed 10% or to agree with the developer and say, oh, you're right, they have slipped below 10%. Um, if we disagreed with that determination, then we would appeal that right then and there. So all of this would happen at the outset of the of the of considering the project. And it could, and I've had this happen in my experience. Um, I've had a safe harbor asserted, I've had a safe harbor challenged and appealed, and it puts the comprehensive permit on hold for like two years. 
And then we, you know, eventually come back to the Zoning Board of Appeals and uh, folks are a little bit surprised that, you know, it's been so long, what took so long? Well, uh, that was just, it has to wind its way through the appeal process. Okay. Mr. Varner, I see you have your hand up. Oh, you're muted. Uh, how's that, I'm on. Uh, I have a couple of questions that are sort of interrelated and center on the word affordability um, or affordable. Uh, I was curious about what percentage of Amherst housing is currently considered affordable and, and what is, infor what is uh, affordable in a market that's as volatile and as hot as Amherst right now? And what's the difference between affordable and market rate in some place like Amherst? Uh, another uh, question I had related to affordable housing is who determines the, the need for more in a given town? Because I know there are, there are some people who always want more affordable housing. And again, affordable is like, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but, um, and, um, yeah, I was just curious about who, who decides the percent of affordable housing, what that percentage is right now in Amherst and, uh, and, and what exactly is affordable. So, uh, to answer your question, uh, the federal government housing and urban development actually breaks Massachusetts down into various, um, regions, uh, based on housing and determines what is like the area median income for the region that you're located in. Affordable right now at least means that there's there's either low or moderate income. So moderate income would be anyone who's at or below 80% of the area median income for the area that HUD says Amherst is in. Um, there's deeper affordability for lower levels. You know, some, it can go down to 30 folks who earn 30% of the area median income. So Amherst, for example, is not being compared to uh, greater Boston, for example. Um, there's also, you know, for, for affordability purposes, anything basically that comes up to 80% AMI is essentially considered affordable. Sometimes we also hear some things, uh, some terms like workforce housing, or we hear uh, percentages like 120% of the area median income. Those right now are not considered affordable housing. That is above the 80% threshold. So that's um, still important housing that other communities are taking on elsewhere, but it's not currently considered to be affordable. The, as in terms of how many units we have to have. Well, state law has said every community should have 10% of its housing stock um, as affordable. So your housing stock numbers are going to change uh, with every development that comes online. Um, it's also subject to every 10 years, the federal census might also change those numbers. But you can go online to the Executive Office of Housing and, Commun and Livable Communities website, and you can review the list of what they call as the subsidized housing inventory. They break down all 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, and they will identify how many housing units Amherst has in total and how many of those are actually affordable. And they'll even then do the math for you as to whether or not you are at you are at or exceed or maybe below the 10 percent one other thing in terms of answering your question of what is affordable affordable has to also mean that the property is subject to an affordable housing deed restriction so whether it's a, a rental property or whether it is a home ownership property the developer, and then this has to pass on to any of his successors and assigns, the developer has to enter into a couple of different types of agreements. One is called a regulatory agreement. The regulatory agreement is generated by the state subsidizing agency, meaning the 
the entity that's going to either provide the financing or maybe some technical assistance to the developer to make this project go forward. That regulatory agreement has a number of components to it, but one of which is it requires that at least 25% of the units in a proposed development. So if we have a hundred dwelling units that are proposed, at least 25 of those would have to be set aside as affordable. It would require the developer to um, engage in what's called an affirmative fair marketing plan which requires a certain amount of outreach to people where you might be more likely to reach folks who are at low or moderate income levels. Uh, you have to conduct a lottery to select them uh, for these units. And once they're in the units, um, those units are supposed to remain affordable in perpetuity. So it may be, for example, in a, a rental property um somebody originally comes in um, as qualifying you know they have to prove that they are income qualified and the income levels are also going to be adjusted based on their household size you know so a single mother with three children is going to have a different income level than say a single person um the single, the, the person who may qualify for an affordable unit, let's say over the years, um, that person uh, starts earning more and more money. Uh, children grow up, children move out of the house, the household size shrinks. It may very well be that at some point, we hope that that income eligible person is now exceeding the income levels. That doesn't mean we kick that person out of their house or out of their apartment. It just means that that unit might now become a market rate unit. And the next unit that be, that opens up would then be designated as an affordable unit. And we would go through the lottery process of trying to find someone who's income eligible and do all of that. It's a little bit different with home ownership because once we, you know, with, with home ownership, we still, we still do a lottery. We still find someone who is income qualified. Um, and if folks then want to resell their property, um, there is usually built into the regulatory agreement. There's usually um, what they call like a, a maximum resale factor that, um, you know, the person who owns the house, who makes some improvements and maintenance to the house you do get to build up some equity in the house, but you still need to resell that house. And this goes for condos as well. You'd still need to resell that unit to an eligible purchase, like an income eligible purchaser upon resale. If we can't find an eligible purchaser, the town of Amherst has a right of first refusal. If the town of Amherst says, we don't want it. That person is allowed to then sell it at market rate. But Amherst is going to get a share of what we call the windfall, which is the difference in value between what they would have been allowed to, to resell the house for based on that resale factor versus what the market rate bears at the time of the sale. And that's a lot of information right there. So I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna pause. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Attorney Murray, maybe I can help. I think one of the questions John had was, how do you determine what's affordable for an individual? So we know that it's 80% of the median income in the area, and then is it a certain proportion of? Does that unit have to be available at a rent that is equivalent to a certain portion of that person's income? It it does. So it's it's adjusted for household size as well. So the income scale is going to change based on how many people are considered in that household. And 30% um, is yeah. generally the threshold they look at um, in terms of, you know, rent, insurance, utilities, et cetera. And that's it. Okay. I have a, yes. just a quick follow-up on that. Um, 
here in Amherst, you know, more than half the town population is student. Uh, students are not well healed. They're all seemingly, most of them would be, would qualify for affordable housing because their incomes are, are next to nothing. And Amherst doesn't do anything to track where students are living right now. So how do we deal with the affordable housing issue uh, and our student housing uh, demand at the same time? I don't understand how we sort out uh, affordable meaning non-student and affordable meaning student if we don't track where students are or um, somehow restrict students getting into affordable housing. Sure. Um, I, I will be honest and say I've never actually been on this side of the process of qualifying people. You know, the, um, there is an application process. So you're right. There are probably students in Amherst right now that would qualify in terms of just their income um, for affordable housing. They have to go through the application process and be approved as an eligible purchaser. Um, I don't know if there is some type of, um, you know, some students, I was one of those <laughs> who, you know, had parents helping with, um, with, with some of my, you know, expenses when I was in school. Um, I don't know how that quite factors in or if it does factor into that application process because I've just, I've never been on, you know, that's usually something only the developer uh, gets involved in. But I, I think it's entirely possible that um, students could possibly qualify for the affordable housing as well. I think Ms. Brestrup has um, some comments. Thank you. Yep. So I wish that Mr. Malloy were here tonight because he's our housing expert, but what I understand is that students, particularly undergraduate students, are not eligible for affordable housing. So, you know, if there's an undergraduate student who's part of a family and the family is eligible for affordable housing, then, of course, that student could live with his family. But students who would apply to be the lessees, is that the right word? Lessor is the person who leases and lessee is the person who lives there. But anyway, so the lessee um, cannot really be an undergraduate student by himself or with another group of undergraduate students and qualify for affordable housing. So that's one thing. Then there were some questions that Mr. Varner asked before, which I thought I could help to answer. Um, one of them was... Um, what is the percentage of Amherst housing that is currently considered affordable? And that is the number that is um, counted on what we call the subsidized housing inventory that the state keeps track of. And our current number, the last time I checked, was 11.76. So 11.76 of our housing is a percent of our dwelling units is considered affordable. And I think we've got about 9,000 housing units altogether. It's probably more now, but anyway, that's the number. Then in terms of what are the rough um, incomes of people who might qualify for affordable housing, I believe, and, and Ms. Murray might correct me in this, but I believe that for a family of four in the Springfield area, metropolitan area, the current um, uh, allowance for a family of four would be $94,000. So you could have a family of four qualifying for affordable housing and they could make as much as $94,000. So that gives you a kind of a ballpark. Um, another thing I wanted to say is that we have affordable housing being built in Amherst by two different mechanisms. One mechanism is the mechanism that Ms. Murray is helping us with, which is when a, an applicant comes in with a 40B project and part of the development is um, going to be affordable housing. In the case of the uh, affordable housing project that's coming along soon, I think there's very little market rate housing. I think it's six units out of 78 or something like that. But generally speaking, um, a project would be more like North Square at the Mill District where you have 130 units and 20% of those units are affordable. Um, so, the, uh, so that's one mechanism that we use to get affordable housing here. But the other mechanism we have is we have an inclusionary zoning bylaw. And the inclusionary zoning bylaw requires that any development 
not counting subdivisions, but any, you know, big apartment building or big mixed use building that comes into Amherst that's being proposed has to have 12% um, of its units affordable. So these big buildings that you see going up, like 11 East Pleasant Street has 90 units altogether, but they're providing 11 affordable units as part of that project. So some of our affordable units are coming through a private development mechanism that is inclusionary zoning, and the others of our affordable units are coming through this comprehensive permit process. And the last thing I wanted to say is I've asked um, the town manager um, to give us uh, authority to or permission to have Ms. Murray accompany us through this 40B process that we are going to be launching into, and he has said yes to that. So sure. um, Ms. Murray was with us for the project up in North Amherst, and that worked out really well. And um, so we're very happy that she is going to accompany us through this project as well. So thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, Mr. Offelt. Yeah, I just I had a question about um, process and interaction with other uh, boards of the town. So I think you, Ms. Ms. Murray, you mentioned at the beginning that um, the ZBA kind of manages the whole um, application application process for the project. <clears throat> so can you just run through how, if it, suppose the site had um, uh, wetlands or something like that, so there was a conservation commission sort of issue. How does the ZBA interact on that, or or does the Conservation Commission get involved at all? And if they do, uh, I guess I'm wondering about a situation where, for whatever reasons, they are slow to slow to act, and we we run into timing problems. So, do you have any comments on that? Sure, I do. I, um, so, at the very outset, when the application comes in. Um, the regulations require that we have seven days to distribute a copy of that application to all local boards, departments to get their feedback. Um, I kind of chuckle at that being in the regulations because I think that that's just a good practice. How do you know what your police chief, your fire chief, your conservation agent would say about a project unless you actually did some outreach to them? So that's one thing that has to be done um but as far as the process so you act in place of any local board exercising any kind of local jurisdiction so it's a little bit um a little um complicated when it comes to the board of health or the conservation commission because they are sometimes exercising authority under state law, in which case that is exclusively reserved to those other boards. But if it is a local Amherst regulation, whether it has to do with Title V or it has to do with wetlands, or maybe we have a greater setback area than the Wetlands Protection Act has, then that's going to be dealt with through the Zoning Board of Appeals. Now, that doesn't stop the zoning board, and I would actually encourage the zoning board to uh, reach out to the conservation commission and staff to help us formulate. You know what what are our concerns? What would be some standard conditions that, if this was exclusively before the conservation commission, what might be some conditions that the conservation commission would want to impose so we can make sure we bring those into our decision? Now. Sometimes the developer has to go to the Conservation Commission for matters under the State Wetlands Protection Act, and sometimes they also have to come before the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, there's no perfect process in terms of which one should come first, um, and sometimes they proceed on parallel tracks. Um, the project that we most recently completed there for Valley CDC they were before the Conservation Commission at the same time that they were before uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals. Timing did work out for us, that we had the benefit of the Conservation Commission's action so that the Zoning Board of Appeals could, that could help inform their decision or maybe even formulate some um, 
some conditions. Right. Sometimes the developer just puts, just takes one board at a time. Right. So a developer might come to the zoning board of appeals first thinking, if I don't get approval here, what difference does it make what the conservation commission would have done, right? So the zoning board sometimes is in a position of, well, we don't know what the conservation commission would or would not do, um, but we've got to, again, reach out to them and incorporate as much as we possibly can um, in terms of conditions into the decision itself. But then there's always some what I consider to be boilerplate language of the decision, which is we always put in a catch-all provision that a developer is required to obtain all federal, state, and local approvals and comply with all other local bylaws or regulations that are not specifically waived by this decision. That's kind of a lovely, broad way of saying, and when you go back to the Conservation Commission, and they tell you what you need to do. You gotta, you gotta comply with their their decision as well. Or if uh, you know you've got to go to the the board of health for a septic system, you're gonna have to comply with whatever the board of health tells you to do as well. Uh, I'll just add to that that you know this is 40B gives the ZBA a lot of authority that it would normally have, and we act for the town on everything except those state and federal mandates that we can't overturn. Or we can't, uh, or we can't vary from. But we need to be humble too, and we have to recognize that we don't have all the all the knowledge of the police and fire department, all the knowledge of the conservation commission, all the knowledge of the board of health. And so there's an active process of seeking their opinion and their input uh, when we get as we make as we go through this process to make our decision. So we do we consult with them, and uh, uh, we go out of our way to make sure that we do that. Well, that's a lot of information and it's, and I don't know, <laughs> it's a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, is there any, are there any other questions on 40B generally, um, not regarding the specific one we have coming up, but regarding 40B generally for, uh, from the members? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, training it was very helpful so after everything happens and uh, they uh, how do we monitor them is there a specific scale that we monitor them with or are there uh, do we have any assistance uh, that whether they're following up or doing what we have set up uh, set them up for thanks sure so um when I mentioned earlier that there's a regulatory agreement with the subsidizing agency that has um, various requirements that the developer has to comply with. One of those is um, it also requires that the developer um, contract with and designate what they call a monitoring agent. And the monitoring agent is looking to make sure that the developer is, if there's supposed to be 25 units that are affordable, that um, they are in fact living up to that commitment. We typically also have um, a local regulatory agreement. It's sort of a, a belt and suspenders approach where we say, if for some reason the state regulatory agreement ever goes away or terminates for some reason, the town's regulatory agreement is then going to take effect. And that, the town's regulatory agreement mirrors the state's agreement in a number of ways, except that the town is now the entity that steps in to uh, make sure that the, the developer continues to comply by the rules. Then there's also your comprehensive permit decision itself. You know, that decision um, gives the board the ability to seek to enforce any provision of the decision. So it could be that the developer doesn't comply with a, a zoning requirement or, or suddenly um, there's some, you know, a, additional development or structures that, that are put on the site that, um, you know, maybe exceed the lot coverage 
that we granted them. We could always take zoning enforcement action based on our decision, um, but we could also seek to enforce uh, the affordability if our regulatory agreement took effect. Okay, thank you. Great. All right. Um, well, we'll be working closely with you, Ms. Murray, as we proceed on this 40B as we did the last time. Your help is really invaluable. And uh, Thank you so much. And i looking forward to it. So have a good rest of the night. Thank you. Take care. Yep. Um, that completes our first order of business. Uh, the next order of business under our um, public meeting is consideration of our management plan for the property located at 15 Hazel Avenue. And Ms. Williams, can you bring uh, Mr. Patel on as a participant? There we go. Well, Mr. Patel, can you just give us your name and address for the record, please? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for your time and service. Um, my first name is Frank and my last name is Patel. And Great. I live in Hadley. My address is 2 Megan's Way in Hadley. And I'm here today to request for the special permit to allow me to use the property 15 Hazel Avenue as a multi-unit um, property which has three um three residential units inside thank you um just for the benefit of board members we um we considered this two weeks ago we asked for this is a situation where the property has changed hands under that under the previous special permit this property when it changes hands the new owners have to come and present a management plan to the board the board has to review that management plan and approve it or make changes with it um, for the um, for the property to be used in the use in this case rental property, not owner occupant rental property. Um, and so, Mr. Patel, we had some questions about the management plan. Mr. Patel came back with an with an amended management plan that we've received, and I think you received the latest uh, amended management plan this afternoon. Um, and so now our job today is to consider whether we want to approve the management plan, the amended management plan that Mr. Patel has sent us this afternoon. So on this panel, we have myself, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Sloviter, and Mr. Henry. Mr. Varner, you weren't on the other panel, so you don't vote on this one, okay? Um, so us, the, four of, the four members who were at, on the last panel uh, are on this, Panel. So, Mr. Patel, um, the last time there were two, I had two questions. The first was the old management plan um, had the property management as the next door neighbor. That's not you. You clarified in this management plan that you are the you and your wife are the property managers. So that's fine. Um, the second one was we talked about the provision that we have been routinely adding to non-owner occupied multifamily units. Um, and that is the, um, you'll see this on the, um, man the amended management plan as the last part of the amended management plan, Amherst Residential Registration, that he has included that, that in the management plan as well. So I think that Mr. Patel, in my opinion, has uh, complied with our requests and has a property, um, a property management plan that I find satisfactory. Uh, and I'd open it up for any other comments or questions from board members. Mr. Patel, is there anything you'd like to say? Um, no, I, again, as I said, you know, I, uh, I, I take the win right now, if I were you. <laughs> this is the first time I'm, uh, this is actually my I second know. time I'm attending a, a, a Amherst Zone meeting. I've never done this before. But I heard the previous uh, one hour talk and there was a lot of information to learn. 
But um, anyways, uh, right now I don't have any questions. And again, I just uh, request if you give me approval to continue use that and I will, and I'm really proud to be, uh, you know, uh, one of the property owners in the town of Amherst. And uh, again, I love this town and uh, I would do a great job owning and managing this property. Thank you. All right. Um, I think the order of business for us to do is to uh, uh, consider a motion to approve the management plan, the amended management plan that we received this afternoon from Mr. Patel, and I would I would entertain such a motion. So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Sloviter seconds. Is there any discussion about the motion or about the management plan? If there's no discussion, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the, the amended management plan. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. The vote is four to nothing. Um, the motion carries. The management plan is approved. And Mr. Patel, uh, congratulations. Thank you everyone again for your for the approval. You bet. Thank you for your work and your cooperation. Your thank you. Thank you. No problem. Um, we're coming up on 717. We have um, another project. When we have a public hearing to start on the University Lodge uh, application. This is, norm this is about the time we normally take a five minute break. So what I'm going to suggest is that we take our 730 break at 720 and we all come back here at 725. How's that? Excellent right. idea. Perfect. Okay, we'll see you in five minutes. Yep, I always take a five minute break.
Mr. Judge, mind if I make a funny remark? No, <laughs> I enjoy it. <laughs> a funny remark is that I've seen Mr. Reedy every day this week. <laughs> Two site visits, a planning board meeting, and now a ZBA meeting. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. I'll have to stop in tomorrow for some reason. We'll just give it a second here until we get all the members back online. There we go. Um, all right. We have a full panel we, and we have um, the applicant's representative so on this, the next order of business is a public hearing on ZBA FY 2025-03, Amherst Development Associates, LLC, request for a special permit under sections 9.22, non-conforming uses, and 3.326, fraternity or sorority buildings, social dormitory, or similar use related to Amherst College, Hampshire College, or the University of Massachusetts to alter a pre-existing non-conforming use hotel motel to a social dormitory on the premises located at 345 North Pleasant Street, map 11C, parcel 250 in the RG general residence zoning districts. Um, we have bef received before us um, submissions of a, a ZA special permit application, a management plan, a complaint response plan, request for certified list of abutters, and a redevelopment narrative, all from the applicant, as well as additional proposed management plans and a blank lease. Uh, the staff has provided a project application report, the latest version of which is dated August 5th, 2024. We did have a site visit on Tuesday, which several members of the, uh, the, the board attended. Um, we observed the property, walked close to the, the uh, it has 
two entrances on two different pleasant streets um, and we walked the parking lots of both. We observed the, um, I guess it would be the east side, uh, which are going to be the studio apartments. We actually went into one of the um, units that are going to be a studio apartment. We looked at, at the unit and the proposed work to be done. We observed the parking areas that were going to be um, resurfaced and where there could be parking located. Um, we went down through the down to the front of the building on, on North Pleasant Street. We uh, observed a, a two family. We entered a two a two room apartment um, that was going to be modified from the existing office. We had discussions about um, lighting, parking, and landscape, and additional information needed for those. Um, we had questions about um, the size of the units and how many people could, you know, what the square footage requirements would be for participants. Um, we had requirements about, questions about ADA spaces. Um, I'm going through my notes. Number of units. Um, we had a, a general conversation about the, uh, the nature, we also had conversation about the nature of the tenants versus the current tenants that are there and how the change in use from a motel to a social dormitory would change the, the, the residents of the property and we asked questions about the term of the lease. I think that covers the big questions that we asked at the, at the site visit. David or um, Ms. Brestrook or Ms. Williams, did we have any other questions that we had asked that need to be noted for the record? I don't, th I don't think so. I think that covered it quite well. There may have been a couple of other comments, but nothing significant. I think that those are the areas of questions that we asked. Yes, I agree. Okay. Great. Uh, and I see Mr. Reedy's here. Um, you're representing the applicant. It, will Mr. Shumway also be here, or, mm -hmm. or are, you, are you doing the presentation? I'm. I'm going to do the presentation. I know I can ask her questions if something comes up that I don't know the answer to. All right. So um, feel free to start, Mr. Reedy. Just give us your Take name. Away. And yep. Great. Sure. Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst, uh, 6 Southeast Street here on behalf of uh, Amherst Development Associates, 345 North Pleasant Street in Amherst, requesting, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair, a special permit. Um, and it's really a finding under 9.22. So uh, I'm, I'm going to show my screen in a minute just to orient everyone to where this property is in relation to downtown UMass and, and just the neighborhood at large. For a little bit of background, um, it's located in the RG zoning district. In 1965, the use as a lodge was an approved use. And so a special permit was issued then to allow uh, the lodge to exist. Fast forward, I think it was 1970. Thank you very much, Ms. Williams, for looking that up and, and finding that out in your development application report. Uh, the, the RG zoning district at that time prohibited lodges from existing. And so at that time, the use became pre-existing non-conforming. It has been a lodge use since 1965. And at this time, what we're looking to do is to take uh, a lawfully pre-existing non-conforming use and looking to under 9.22 change it to another non-conforming use which is the social dormitory um, and what we need is a finding that it's not significantly different in character or its effect on the neighborhood and so you know to, to do that analysis I think you have to take what exists and then talk about what's being proposed and so at the site visit, Mr. Slover asked a very good question. Essentially, I'll summarize, what's the difference? And you know, I, I, I think that the applicant is very excited to go from a, a, tran a transient oriented development and use, which has an average night stay of less than two nights. It has an average of 1.9 uh, occupants per room. 
And according to Mr. Shumway, over 9,000 occupants in the course of a year to go to go from that to, you know, within 21 units to 16 units, uh, 17 beds with hopefully year leases for all of the occupants. And so it it gives much, it's a much less intensive use uh, than what's happening now. It gives more predictability and consistency. It allows uh, screening to happen, which does not happen with the lodge tenants. It's just, you know, people book through whatever booking mechanism that they use and they don't feel that that ownership and people may be going there for a weekend party at UMass and then coming back and not respecting the property uh, to folks who are going to be living here for the duration. And so I think from a, from a management standpoint, from a neighborhood standpoint, um, it's going to be less intensive and, and, and better, let's say uh, qualitatively, than what's happening there now. So I think just to keep that in mind as we're talking about, is it going to be substantially different in character or effect? If, if anything, I might say it, 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 it will be for the better, right? It, and it, that's not part of the analysis, but it's not going to be worse than what it is. And it's, it's going to be better than what exists there currently. Um, what I will do is I'll share my screen just to orient folks to we are. And so it is the yellow highlighted piece. So I'll, I'll zoom in in a moment. You've got UMass here, football stadium over here, center of town where Amity and Maine meet. So the town hall is right here at the bottom of the screen. And so, you know, the, the nice part about this is the location. And it's a sizable lot, especially for this area. You're a little over one acre. Uh, you've got entrances, one off East Pleasant Street, and then one off North Pleasant Street as well. And it's existed in this same configuration. You know, I could I could go back and maybe I'll do just that right here to show you historically. You know, so this is an ortho from 1967, and you're seeing essentially the same uh, layout entrance parking area, et cetera, that you have now, which is um, you know, going to be part of the presentation is the, the minimal nature of change to the exterior of the site. And uh, for all intents and purposes, the minimum, minimal interior structural changes uh, to the interior of the site. So this is, this is the site. And now I'll go through and show some of the, I'll show the site plan. And so what you see here, um, let me see if I have the arrow. Yeah, north is going to be to the left. And so from that last photo, we were looking at it from this side. So East Pleasant Street is at the top of the page. North Pleasant is at the bottom of the page. You've got University Lodge, the, the length of it, the upper area here. Um, these are where the studios are going to be. The lower area here, those are where the one bedrooms are going to be. And then this is where that two bedroom is going to be. There are 26 parking spaces, um, two uh, ADA spaces. They're labeled here, one here and one here. Um, the What is not labeled here, and, and we can certainly do it either as a condition of approval prior to receipt of a certificate of occupancy or as a condition of approval to come back, you know, once the the uh, plan is done, and we have asked George Cook from Randy Eiser's office, Harold L. Eaton and Associates, to, to provide that information. But what you don't see is this labeled as grass, this labeled as grass, this labeled as grass. Same thing here. You don't see, I think there is a birch tree here. There might be another birch tree here. Um, and there's some other vegetation and trees along here. There is a light uh, located here, and then there's another light located here. Um, what we also don't show are the under this it's a porch, I call it a breezeway. Outside of these units are uh, downcast lights that you would have is essentially in a porch. So we're not showing those. We can show them again, either through either mechanism. Um, you know, if you want to approve it tonight, which we obviously love, 
uh, as a condition of approval. If you're going to make us come back, then obviously we'll come back with that uh, in hand. You've got planters, um, at least one located in this area. And what uh, the applicant is looking to do is really just resurface the parking area. If you've been up there, as, as many of you had, and I'll, I'll acknowledge Mr. Uh, Varner was there with me this morning. We met at 8 o'clock, so he was able to walk around. We were also able to get into one of the studio units up here, so he was able to get a sense of that, that size. Um, but if you've been up there, it's kind of broken up asphalt, and so that would all be resurfaced as as part of this project. And what I'll do is I will show the exterior elevations, and then we can talk about floor plans, and I'll talk a little bit about management. Uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, no real changes to the exterior. I think what they're going to do or what they are going to do is paint the exterior and paint the doors. They're keeping everything the same color. Um, if you notice, there were large signs at the property, University Lodge. Uh, if this is approved, they're not going to need such large identifying signs because uh, folks who will be occupying it will live there. And so they're not going to have to try to attract folks who are only going there for a weekend or need a place to stay and realize there's a lodge. Uh, this is going to be more of a, a residence. Um, and so we would we would propose to come back in the future with whatever the signs will look like uh, if we're approved. And so you've got, again, West Elevation. So this is going to be from North Pleasant Street, that larger parking lot. This is the North Elevation. So you can't really see this. This is uh, there's a retaining wall. Essentially, if if our back was against it, this is what you would see. You've got the south elevation, and then you've got the east elevation, and this is from up top where the the studios are. Again, no structural changes, just the uh, coat of white paint, and then the doors are going to be painted as well. Uh, show. All right, I'm going to go to the one in studios to show that. All right, so here you have your typical single units studios. Uh, these are the ones that you're entering from that East Pleasant Street side. This is essentially this unit is what we had visited. You come in, you've got bathroom, you've got closet. And then you've got um, the range, the sink. I think these might be flip-flopped in the unit that we were in. Uh, some additional countertop space, that uh, air conditioning unit, and then the double windows right here. And I think I'm going to bleed into management a little bit. Um, when I talked to Mr. Shumway, uh, we'd be amenable to restricting occupancy of one and two, sorry, strike that, uh, studios and one bedroom units to no more than two unrelated individuals. We thought that that was you know, a, a, a fair way to do it. What we would wanna carve out though is families because we just, we don't want to get into a situation where there's, you know, I know this is a social dormitory, but if you know a, a, a parent has matriculated and this is where they're residing and they've got a young child, uh, frankly, I just don't know enough about the law to say we could say no, my sense is you, can't discriminate to say, no, the family can't live here. So while we're okay with the limitation of no more than two unrelated occupants in the studios and the ones, uh, we would just like a carve off for, for families just to avoid any uh, potential discrimination. So um, that's the uh, studio side by side. And then the one bedroom, these are the ones that you access from North Pleasant Street. It's essentially taking what you have here and combining them. And so you've got a, a door into the living area. You've got the kitchen area here. Uh, you've got uh, uh, water heaters tucked away here, but you've got your electric range with hood, your refrigerator and your sink. And you go through this door, which they've cut in essentially separating the previous lodge units. And you've got your bedroom with your full bath over here. Uh, the doors for aesthetic reasons, from the exterior, these doors are both remaining. 
um, you know, practically speaking, I don't know how much this one will be used, but I think for the aesthetics, then uh, uh, the applicant has decided to leave both doors. So the, that's the studios and the one bedrooms. And I'll show you the two bedroom. And then I'll talk a little bit more about management. And so there's only uh, one two bedroom. This is um, the, the nub that comes off the balance of the building where the office uh, was. And so you've got, it's a little bit more spacious. Obviously you got your kitchen living area. You've got you know, a bedroom with your closets, you've got another bedroom with its closet and then one bathroom. And so in total, you're getting 16 units um, with 17 beds. So it's 10 studios, five one bedrooms and one two bedroom. Uh, they all have one bathroom. And so you're really going from 21 units, 21 beds, transient living to 16 units, 17 beds, much more, I, I'd say, stable and consistent uh, occupancy. Um, as far as management goes, uh, you know, Kurt's been around, uh, his family and, and he, they, they manage 150 units in the area. Um, we've got a complaint response plan that we provided. Sherry Willie works in his office. And so she's really can that first line of defense if something were to happen. Uh, as far as parking goes, there are 26 spaces, as I mentioned, 16 units. What we would do is allocate one space per unit. Uh, and then there are 10 additional spaces. Notably, two of those are uh, ADA spaces. What we would ask for is to allow discretion to the management company to be able to use those spaces how they best see fit. Right? Sometimes that would be a certain number for guests. Uh, sometimes it would be for additional vehicles for the unit occupants. Uh, so we would ask for that discretion. Um, otherwise, is you know as, as far as high level goes, not a tremendous amount of changes. And so, I mean, with that, we're happy to answer any questions that you have about um, site, interior, uh, management, et cetera. Great, thank you, Mr. Reedy. I got a couple of questions just to start. Mm -hmm. um, so on the complaint response form, uh, Sherry Willie is the 24-7, 365 contact. Um, with all the units he operates, I'm assuming that the phone number on that, that uh, complaint response form is a phone number that's answered 24-7, 365. I believe uh, so. Is that right? I mean, so you would want to, I just want to make sure that there's an alternative because Sherry Willie is going to be gone at some point and not you know, she's going to be not answering the phone. Um, so it, what's... We can we get you a answer? second name. We can get you a second name for that, if that's what you're looking for. Um, what I'm looking for is making sure that, you know, 24-7, 365, there's somebody that can be contacted for the complaint. So that would be good. That's great. Um, secondly, in, in your management plan, you mentioned, or I think it's the narrative, you mentioned that there is additional oversight provided by UMass for social dormitories. And I don't know what they, what they provide, what's required, what they require or how they interact with homeowners or landlords, excuse me. Yeah, and so this is, I'm, I'm probably gonna toss it over to you, Mr. Morris. So I'm gonna give you a heads up before I do that. But this is my first social dormitory that I've permitted, but I know that Archipelago has, I think, permitted two in the fraternity residence district. One of the requirements, as I understand it, for social dormitory is that the occupant is, at least one occupant, is matriculated at an institution of higher education. And so, uh, to me, that is oversight through student life, because if something were to happen and that uh, occupant were no longer uh, matriculated, uh, then they wouldn't be able to have housing here either. And so, somewhat necessarily, there is going to be a link between the landowner, lessor, and the uh, institution of higher education to make sure that the occupants are behaving, are matriculated, and that there aren't any issues. So it gives that additional, you know, where in a typical apartment, if somebody acts up and, and fails out of school, there's no nexus between their occupancy and their matriculation status. Here, it's a little bit different, but, but maybe, Mr. Moore, you can correct me. Uh, no, I don't have anything to add to that. Right. 
Hi. <laughs> yeah, so, I. Ms. Reswina, um, since you're yeah. not on the, on the panel, oh. we're going to have you, if you, you can ask, uh, you can make comments during the, the comment period. But okay, uh, thank you. during the hearing, it's just the, it's just the, mm -hmm. the, the members seated for this panel. But feel free to, to ask questions during the comment period. Um, so, Mr. Reedy, I, I, I'm as confused as you said you were about it. So, give me the short answer again on what the sure. university's goal is. It just if a student is, is kicked out, he can't be in there anymore? Or what's for graduate? Is that the deal? Simply, that's, correct. That's the extent yeah. of the oversight. Correct. Okay, all right. But it's, it's not like they have um, a contract with a student that they don't have, that they don't have parties or that they have to get a permission correct. for a party or anything like that. Okay, correct. all right. Good. All right. Um, I had a couple of other questions. Uh, the lighting for the parking lot. I noticed the existing lighting looked like it was damaged um, on the on North Pleasant Street. I don't know if it's downcast and um, um, dark sky compliant. But so is that lighting meant to light the parking lot for safety? And and same thing with the lighting on the East Pleasant Street side. Is that meant for for um, for safety and how does it go on on its own? Is it always on? Is it motion activated? How does that work? Yeah, I, so yes, they're for safety. The one on North Pleasant Street uh, was damaged by the tree that fell. It essentially knocked it down so it's not facing onto the parking lot. I don't believe they're dark sky compliant because I think they're oh. somewhat antiquated. Um, and I, I want to say it's, they almost look like they were uh, Western Mass Electric poles that put the the lights on those poles. Um, there's a new pole, I think, going in on the East Pleasant Street side that looks much more substantial than the existing pole. Um, and I think they do go on at, um, uh, at nighttime. So it's either by timer or um, uh, I think, I forget what it's called, photo, photo sensitive. Oh, okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah. When it goes on, once it turns to, I know Mr. Meadows, you'll you'll correct me, but it's <laughs> the one that turns on once it gets dark enough outside. Photo cell. Photo cell. So there you go. All right. Um, and the, what about the lighting under the covered walkways, the breezeways? Is that always on? Or is it, again, that's going to be motion activated or what? I don't believe those are motion activated. I think those are timers, but let me check with Kurt and I'll let you know. Okay. So that's. So, I mean, those are some of the, we have, I have some lighting questions. It's also a light that we did not, that was not on the plan that is on the a retaining wall on the north side, on the lower edge. There's a, a large non dark sky compliant light that currently exists, which would cast light up as well as down. And I don't know if it would trespass into the neighboring property, but if you look on the retaining wall, north side, lower level, there's another light there. Um, so I think, I think those, we should have answers to that and on a plan of what you wanna do, how they are gonna be dark sky compliant and that would be um, information I'm interested in seeing. And so just, um, cause I know we're going with this, Mr. Chair, we've been in front of each other enough. Um, <laughs> do you, because I so what that means uh, is that we're probably coming back, and so the question not is necessarily uh, okay. the, the board may not agree with my my okay. opinion. So, but but go ahead. Okay, so the the question then is uh, is the expectation from the board for the applicant to replace the existing lights with dark sky compliant lighting? I think, especially the damaged one, he's going to have to do it anyway. Yep. I, I think that would be the expectation of the board. Okay. I think the one on the wall, it's not a lot to it, it's not a lot to replace that, and it's probably ancient. Um, I would expect that to be um, probably has met its useful life, and it'd be any replacement of lights has to be dark sky compliant. And I would like to see that, especially because it would it would cast light up, and I don't know about the neighbors, so. That I would like that to be, and the one on the East Pleasant Street, um, I think it's if it's going to be replaced, it has to be dark sky compliant. But I have no idea how how it washes the neighborhood or washes beyond itself. 
1965, there wasn't as much concern about this. There is now, we've got a new use, a new special permit. Um, so I, I'd like to have your opinion on that and see what you guys think about on that one. And then in terms of the, just in terms of the, the walkway lights, just it's a matter of sort of um, quality of life. If they're on by dark all night long, those are the windows into the units. I suspect safety can be achieved by having motion activated, but it's not on all the time. That would be my preference, but certainly I think they are dark sky, dark sky compliant already. So I don't know if you have if you have to do that because of our uh, to per to be um, compliant with our rules and regs in the committee. Okay. So that's that's where I am on that. And then, um, well, I can. I'll let other people, I've, I've asked enough questions for now. I'll let some other people ask questions and I have a couple more. So Mr. Varner, your hand was up first. Oh, you're, you're muted, Mr. Varner. Sorry, um, thanks first to uh, Attorney Reedy for meeting me this morning and walking me through. Again, taking his time to do that was kind. I had one question uh, when we met this morning about the placement of waste containers. I think in the text of the proposal, there was mention of an enclosed area for the waste containers. It doesn't appear on any of the drawings. And I know that the turn from uh, Pleasant Street up into the parking lot is rather tight for one of these trucks with a lift on it. So I assume it's gonna be on the North Pleasant side, but again, there's no designation of where that's gonna go or how it's gonna abut the neighboring property or the building itself. Um, and I'd like to see that uh, spelled out more clearly. The other thing that I'm a little concerned about is the uh, the stipulation that, that the renters have to be matriculated students. Um, I'm just, I don't know how that's gonna work out in terms of people who, for instance, uh, halfway into the, the fall term decide, no, I can't really do school right now, I'm gonna drop out. Or, um, you know, do they actually get evicted or, and who's responsible for doing that? What's the mechanism? Uh, or if somebody uh, decides, oh, you know, I think I'll sign up for a course at UMass and, you know, I, that way I can sign, I can get a, a lease at this, at the lodge. Um, I, I don't know if there's going to be an act of contact back and forth between the lessor and the university or college to monitor who's a student and who's not going through the year uh, and what happens if somebody uh, lapses in their student uh, identification uh, you know what do they get evicted uh, do they stay around for the term of the lease um, I don't know how that works and uh, Mr. Reedy, before, Mr. Reedy, before you answer um, and just to piggyback off that as well I, I also had similar concerns because um, there is a lease um, which each person is required to sign so I mean, is this can is the lease condition precedent? They have to be in school for the lease to be valid. Um, I didn't see any language to that extent in the lease because, you know, if there's lease, that's it. They have a, whether they're in school or not, the lease trumps them not being in school. So how does that work? Yeah, and so I guess one of the questions is going to be for Mr. Moore, and if there is any grace period uh, between the loss of matriculation in one of the institutions of higher education and the requirement that uh, a tenant be evicted, uh, or could you just let the natural term of the lease run out and then not renew it if they weren't matriculated? And I, I, frankly, I just don't know the answer. It's a To me, it's a zoning enforcement question. Because doesn't also the management company, the property owner, have a vested interest that people don't break the lease? Certainly. Mr. Mora. Yeah, so we have a couple of properties that have that condition of the permit um, that you're talking about. <clears throat> now, the bylaw doesn't specifically require it. It doesn't have to become a, a condition of this permit. It doesn't have to be that every occupant is uh, enrolled in in uh, some sort of uh, in the university or college. Uh, so that's really up to you on how you want to place that condition. The planning board and the larger properties has included a condition like that. And I think that's you know noted in your project application report as an option. Uh, what would happen is the, the lease would expire on its natural terms and then it's up to the manager, uh, the property manager to uh, ensure that you know, according to either the conditions of the permit or whatever their uh, rental policies are, 
they're confirming that for the renewal of the lease. So we would not expect eviction in the middle of the lease term in, in that situation. Thank you. Did I answer your question, Mr. Barner? Okay. Um, Mr. Meadows. Um, I have a variety of questions. Uh, I, I, I should state, I think this is a great idea, but um, the entrance to the property on East Pleasant Street, typically in the winter that is either uh, intentionally closed off or they don't plow it um, and therefore it's impossible never mind to bring a vehicle up there you can't even walk up there because it's too icy and and difficult is that something that the fire department uh needs to have as access to the building is that something that is intended to be kept open um do you know what the intentions are yeah i mean the intent is to close it during the winter because it is so okay. steep uh, and, and I don't want to say potentially hazardous, but that's why that it's not touched to push folks over to the North Pleasant Street side. The parking lot is, and so I think there'd still be access, you know, North Pleasant and around the building up to that East Pleasant Street parking lot, but just not that access directly onto East Pleasant Street. Thank you. Um, do you know what the HVAC system is going to be for each of these apartments? Uh, I know that the studios have air conditioners um, sticking out of, and, and maybe what I'll do is I will try to find a good picture. Here, let me share my screen a little bit here. It's probably a good one. Just if you can see, because I think this will do a couple of things. Um, right where this mouse is, let's see if I can... Uh, well, let, let me zoom in. This is the uh, light that yep. uh, the chairman was talking about, uh, Mr. Judge. This is that light that you were, you know, and it, it, I don't know that it's dark sky compliant. It's also certainly antiquated. You've got the uh, uh, air conditioners up here in each of these units, and those are brand new. And then I will check with Kurt on the lower units and just the location of those um uh hvac and the heating i would assume then is electric strip or what is it no why don't i let me um kurt i'm gonna bring you in uh jacinta could you let uh kurt shumway in i think it'd probably be instead of me going back and forth with him it's probably best because he knows his property better yeah. than better than i i'll stop sharing um, I think if the person is J.C. Shumway, they are continually declining to become a panelist. <laughs> I've tried to add him several times, so uh, you might want to talk Spots up, Kurt. Spots yeah. up. <laughs> you don't have to show yourself, Kurt, but okay. He said try again. Okay. <laughs> Okay, he's, I guess he's accepted this time. Mr. Shumwerig, uh, can you give us your name and address for the record? And you're muted right now. Good evening. I thought that was one of my pop-up screens that was telling me my computer's about to shut off. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kurt Shumway, and my uh, uh, my home address you're looking for, 309 East Pleasant Street, just up the street from the site. Got it. Thank you. I can turn the video on. Yeah, I'm not intending not to do that. I, oh, boy, I, think, dark. I think there were a couple of questions regarding the the uh, HVAC systems and the heating Sure. The, they're the same units as they are upstairs. They're all brand new through the, uh, essentially through window type units. And they're in every room. Two of them in the one bedrooms, and one of them in each of the in the uh, each of the studios. Is what the about, heating and the, and the heating is the uh, baseboard, as you mentioned? Yeah, it's an electric baseboard. And yeah. and does each apartment have its own meter, or is it central? 
it is being metered uh, separately. Okay. I may have a suggestion for you, but we'll take that offline. Okay. At some Thank point. Um, does this, the second, another question, does this fall under the requirement, the state requirement for EV charging stations now with the transition? If you're asking me, I would uh, go to Rob. Uh, I, I'm not aware of it. We I, did, I, we did. I think the question is for Rob, yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Morrow. Uh, there, there is no requirement for EV charging stations for this project. Um, is it probably would be beneficial to have a couple there. Uh, and there's certainly money available for them from the state. So it's a, a suggestion. And uh, I'm assuming all the lighting would end up being LED. But uh, the last question, if this is open to, I assume open to UMass students, Hampshire College students, uh, Amherst College students, and does each of the schools have to keep track of the, the students who are living there? Is that how it's done with this type of facility? If if you're asking me, I can say no. I don't. I don't. Uh, uh, we don't get involved with what the universities or colleges do as far as keeping track of their students. Is it part of a social dormitory? Typically, or or is this is all new? So yeah, yeah I mean, it, if, me me as well. But as a manager, we don't. I mean, we we did. There's a few comments I could have commented on earlier. We. We do manage very, very closely uh, where our tenants are, uh, where they are, to the point of if they're still in school or not. Um, mm -hmm. But Rob's comment about, uh, I think legally it would be pretty tough to terminate a lease, and you know how that goes in town anyhow. But if, if it were re a requirement, then we would uh, expect that the lease just to run out. And then um, if depending on the your requirements, either um not allow them to renew the lease or uh, whatever be appropriate there but we do have a very close relate you know i i tell my tenants i hope we don't get to know you too well because if we do um they're probably trouble um we've had a pretty good luck with that rob's department can speak to that and uh the police uh department also knows us very well for not having to come to our properties very often I, there, there could be some other questions there. The, the dumpster questions, we typically have that in the on the East Pleasant side. What I'll say typically, historically, as a lodge. And also, I'll speak to the downlighting that you mentioned earlier, and I can talk to you about sort of the pros and cons of any of the decisions. But um, the, the dumpster typically has been on the East Pleasant side uh, in the corner uh, kind of tucked away. Um, if I were to answer your question where it was going to be as of this meeting, I would say it would be there. Um, I think though that I'm not sure if I were a tenant, I'd want to have that out front of my door there. So there's going to be some rethinking a little bit about whether that's the best place for it. Um, of course you have neighbors, you have quality of life and smell and all those types of things. Uh, but that's where I would say it was going to be as of this conversation. Um, there are also some questions about the down lighting out in front of the doors, about the timers or uh, sensors. Um, we tend to keep them on um, and maybe and uh, have them turn off at a certain period, two or three in the morning. Um there's pros and cons to that. If they're light censored, you're going to have people coming in and out and um, they're constantly going to be going on and off. And that could be a distraction. Typically what happens is they'll be on more than they're off for safety reasons and that people will just close their shades to keep uh, the lighting from coming into their units. We would prefer them to be on more than off for safety reasons. And they're not that bright that they're, they're sort of a safety they can they can give you a, a safe walkway into your entrance, but they're not so glaring that they're going to go through, you know, 
uh, distract and be a problem for any neighbors. Of course, it's been there for years. We've never had any problems. Um, so we found keeping them light, keeping them on is better. So, Mr. Shumway, that's those then those walkway lights are timed. Is that what you're talking? About? I I will tell you that I'm not a hundred percent whether they're timed or they're censored. Um, yeah. I would say to you though that our 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 better our best practices will be to try to keep them on and keep them somewhat on a dimmed uh, in a dimmed fashion so they're not terribly bright. Okay. Yeah, I'm not really worried about uh, trespass another property with those. I was just, I was just considered uh, considering the safety. Good. Go ahead. I, I didn't mean to. Yeah, I, there, there was just a lot of conversation. I guess I was being invited and I kept clicking no. But um, I'm happy <laughs> to comment further about some of the other questions that Tom maybe uh, was going to. How about the big lights, the parking lot lights? Um, yeah, well, you, know, you talk to me you... about that. Yeah, on the East Pleasant side, we find that the lighting there is is has been and continues to be satisfactory. Has not we've not, not had any complaints. Um, it would be my hope and expectation just not to to touch that. Uh, the one that you mentioned earlier, uh, there's a lot of trees that are down in that area. I'm going to be doing some heavy uh, uh, trimming, and uh, that light will be repaired and. Of course, the goal is to create a safety situation and not be uh, a problem for the neighbors. That's what everybody wants. That's what you would want. That's what I would want. That's what the neighbors would want. So um, I'm not familiar with the terminology. You call it a dark sky. I guess that's 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 the one. If, if it needs to be changed out, we'll change it out. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm sure Tom can give you more detail on that, but the... Dark sky compliant is a is a is a lighting term of art, um, and you can find those. And I I think any new lights uh, should be dark sky compliant. Yeah, I mean it's common sense. I think it's a smart yeah. thing. Yeah. And the other one is that that light on the retaining wall that probably should be changed out to be dark sky compliant as well. Yeah, that's fine. I, honestly, I don't even know if it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let's um, go ahead, Mr. Shumway. Is there anything else you want to say before we go to other questions from board members? I'll, I'm just here to be available to uh, answer your questions. Great. Mr. Sloviter. Uh Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a number of questions that are related to the number of people on the site and some ambiguity or conflicts in numbers in the lease agreement. Uh, first of all, I, I would say it's, it's, cl it's clear to me that, that this proposal will uh, make the site uh, less impactful. There will be less activity at certain times. The stability of long-term leases is a positive thing. So I... I inherently think that there's positive aspects of this. I wanted to say something nice at the beginning. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> uh, there are some provisions in the lease that are at odds with some of the representations of what will be on the site. For instance, Mr. Reedy said that there would be a limit of two people in the studios and the one bedrooms which means that there could be over 30 people on this site. So I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, I'll am I'm. bring up a number of points rather than ask for a response one at a time. Uh, clause number seven in the lease says that the it's limited to one car per person, but if there's more than one person allowed to live in the unit, then that could be two cars. What if a couple lives in one unit? Is that two cars? But the lease says per person, not per unit. Uh, section 4J allows up to five people in the unit at any time, no more than three overnight guests. So that would be four. It's an awfully tight unit to have four people there overnight, but nevertheless, the lease does permit it. So three overnight guests 
at least from my reading, is the uh, the lessee and three overnight guests. And what if they all got there with cars? There's the possibility of an enormous influx of cars onto this site at various times, depending on how you read the lease and what's limited. Uh, the, your application says social dormitory is not substantially different in character uh, from what has been there. But there is also some potential that a concern that I have about college students, many of whom may know each other or become friendly. If four friends rent four units, this sounds like a party. This is sort of a built-in block party if this is a lot of college students who know each other and they're all present and they're all from a similar background and a similar economic class, perhaps. And I'm just concerned about the fact that there is no on-site management and no supervision. So it's, it's the potential numbers that are permitted in the lease, potential activity in nice weather, do you have any thoughts on any of this? I'm not I'm not trying to get into a debate. I'm just trying to find out what you think will really what's going to protect this from any of this happening. I'm happy to speak unless Tom you want. To. No, Kirk Kirk go ahead. I think my only comment would be to Mr. Sloverter that um the lease is evolving and I think just as you know the, the conversation with Kurt about the occupancy limit and the discussions with the zoning board of appeals certainly influenced that discussion. So that it's not apparent in the lease that you have in front of you is not surprising. It's uh, we will provide a final lease based upon what is the outcome of these discussions. So now I think Kurt will probably talk about overall uh, management. Uh, but, I have one more question that just popped into my mind because of something that Mr. Judge said uh, at the site inspection. We, we asked what the size of these units are, the studio units. And Mr. Judge said at, when we were standing in the unit that he was under the impression, but wasn't certain that uh, there's a minimum of 150 square feet per person or some rule like that uh, for occupancy. So it it's even possible but I don't know the answer, and I'm, I guess I'm asking if you know the answer. It may not be legal for two people to be living in one of these permanently. I'm not talking about an overnight guest. I don't know how big the unit is, but it didn't look very large. Looked to me not much over 200 square feet. Kurt, I don't know if you know. Not, not. I'll ask Mr. Moore again. I, I think I can. I, I think I can um, try bring some light onto that question. In, con in conversation with the staff today, I think the, there's a requirement for at least 150 square feet for an individual. And for each additional individual, it's 100 more square feet. So for two people, you'd need 250 square feet. I think that's right if I understand it. And I don't know what it is for three or four if it's another 100 square feet for each person. But I think that's, and that's, is that a state building code or is that an Amherst building code? Uh, Mr. Judge, you're correct. That's the state sanitary code and it's 150 and then 100 for each additional occupant. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Sloviter, I can comment on uh, most of your other questions really are more of a, a, a man, you know, management question. And it's good that I'm here because I can tell you that Yes, I'm glad that Tom talked to the lease, lease that it's evolving. This is the, the, the first of this type that we've had, and it's a very simple uh, modification to uh, uh, sort of give the tenant the parameters of what our expectations are to be good neighbors. And um, I've always told my tenants that at my age, if you have three or four people over, that's a gathering, anything over that, then it's a party. 
and I don't want parties. So uh, they kind of get the flavor of, of what we, how we define that. Um, you're, not, you're not incorrect as far as potentially having people who know one another next door. That, that happens everywhere. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, like any, any, uh, tenant or apartment situation that does create a scenario that they might want to have some party activities that comes up, that, that comes back to me and my, my, my group that we manage them quite carefully. I live just up the road. I go by there many, many times. I'm a very active, uh, driving around while managing properties to make sure things are going well. Um, again, our management uh, reputation, I think, is uh, is one that speaks for itself as far as containing that. Um, the number of maximum tenants, hypothetically, you're probably right. We can contain that in the lease. Um, you, not any different than a full occupancy weekend at, at the hotel, uh, that we would have that and have that many cars as well. Uh, it's unlikely that we would have that many. Uh, we prefer not to have that many. We expect to have uh, most of the studios, we expect to be one one person. And uh, I would venture to guess most of the one bedrooms will be, you know, maybe half of them will be uh, single occupants. Uh, so that's sort of the reality of the demand. And uh, so we don't, we I, I don't expect that to be an issue. The parking, uh, even though the, the lease speaks, as you had mentioned, we will modify it, but we control that. Uh, we will basically say one parking space per unit. And any cars that are parked there, we give them parking stickers. And every night in all of my apartment uh, buildings, we have it. Uh, we have a tow truck that goes through. And if you do not have a parking sticker, you get towed. And if people have guests, we give them guest passes. So we we manage that. We feel we manage that quite well. Um, and once again, if you go through our parking lots downtown, where everybody's looking for, for parking, our parking lots are not full, uh, with the exception of our tenants, on busy weekends because people will get towed. I'm not a very uh, popular guy for that, but... Uh, that's what we do and my tenants appreciate that so we control the parking very tightly we control occupancy very tightly we control partying very tightly uh, i have sherry she lives down the road from me i live there i have two other people in the office i have three maintenance full-time on call uh, we are local and we're always around and if i didn't catch all your questions shoot shoot me off the rest of them uh, no, you ad you addressed most of them, most of it. I would, I would. Um, it's the math, the number of units times the number of possible tenants that Mr. Right. Reedy said were permitted, and the and visitors and cars. These things, I think. There's the if you if you use the biggest numbers, there is a, a lot of activity and a lot of people. And if this is controlled, I think it should be controlled a bit more specifically from the lease. But if the lease is evolving, I don't have an issue with it. I believe in evolution. <laughs> we <laughs> again, I think uh, practically speaking, it's highly unlikely that the maximum will, will occur. Uh I'm not sure how I'd want to regulate that from the zoning perspective, but I, I'm pretty confident in our history and, and knowledge and understanding and ability to control all this stuff. Um, that the 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 amount of complaints that will be generated from here will be far fewer than what they were as a lodging facility. Okay, thank you. You know, it's, Mr. Slover, I did the same math you did. I looked at the lease, and when you look at five overnight guests per unit and come up with 85 guests at a time uh, if you look at um or no not overnight that's guests and yes. you look at three overnights by 17 units that's 51. it's clear that the lease doesn't address this property it has to be modified and, and that's yep. the reason we asked for a lease to be 
for us to look at a lease. So Fair we're enough. doing exactly what we're just doing right here. And so this, yep. I think, is productive for everybody. Um, but that's that's a really good question. Also, I am. I would like to see uh, the schematic for the, because you're going to keep the same walls. So, so I'd like to see a schematic that gives me dimensions for studios, one bedroom and the two bedroom. So I can judge it. I mean, I don't think you ought to have a lease that allows two people to live in a 150 square foot unit, right? If the, you know, I, th I think I want to make sure that you're, that we aren't approving a um, occupancy uh, density that exceeds the sanitary code. So that's, so when, I would guess that that first unit is not 250 square feet. I guess it's a single, I think it's a, you'd have to, seems to me it ought to be those studios or one person. I don't know about the, about the one bedrooms. I just don't know what the size and square footage is, but you can't violate the sanitary code. We'll get you that. I, I think they are above, I think they're, I mean, I did some rough calculations and I think it, it comes out more than 250, but we'll certainly. For the um, studios? The yeah. Studio. And I, I just used the scale of whatever. Grant, I'm an, I'm an attorney, right? So I did it. Let me, let's, let's have a real professional look at Somebody it. Somebody really yeah. bright once told me, don't do math on TV. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea that we get it done totally exactly and, and provided to us okay sure yep yeah, because i'm I, I just violated my own rule there but i at least have worked it out ahead of time well yes the, the, one one of the th reasons that i like numbers so much is that they're not debatable if the if the unit is over 250 square feet that's one thing if it's 220 square feet which is but what i think it is just from looking at it then it's under and then one of the other questions, and I don't know the answer, and I'm not asking it really now unless somebody knows the answer. If the minimum for two people is 250 square feet, does that mean two people in permanent long-term residence? Does it mean two people uh, for up to, but not more than five days? I don't know how some of these rules are written, but once you know objectively with a tape measure, which I'll be happy to lend to Mr. Reedy, because even though he's a lawyer, I'm sure he can use a tape measure, you can figure it out. It's there's no mystery with this. It's just a matter of getting the number and then finding out how the rule is applied. So I don't know what even a two, if it's over 250, what does that tell you? Or and if it's under 250, can someone have a visitor? for a long weekend, but they can't change their address. I don't know what the answers are, but I think they need to be clarified and mathematics is our friend. Understood, okay. we'll take care of it. Um, I have just another quick question. Um, I think in the site visit, it was mentioned that new doors are gonna be provided and new windows, is that correct? Or I think you said same doors, and then I think BJ said new windows, Kurt. So I think no, we we put all new we put a uh, all new windows on the interior of the studios. Okay. Um, so uh, they're all new there. There's only new doors, uh, new doors going in between the two, uh, in the when we're creating the two rooms to be one bedrooms. So okay. there's five new doors. All the other doors are remaining as is and just painted up and pretty up. All right. And the other thing that I think we should all um, take note of is that this building will be for the first time um, have, a, have a sprinkler system. It will be sprinkled. And I think that's a great improvement in the property if, in terms of safety of the tenants and everything else. Um, that's a great improvement in the property, and uh, I want to. I'm, I'm glad it's being done. I, I, I don't think you can do it safely without that. So that's a really good improvement. Um, Could I rewind? There is one new door being put in that I didn't mention. That would be in that uh, two bedroom unit. I don't want to forget that. 
All right. All right. There's a new door that will be cutting in there. That so, um, I don't think we. I don't want to forget that. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Uh Chair just Judge, yeah. I just yeah. wanted to um, hopefully shed some light on, I think it was Mr. Slobiter's question or your question. So uh, dwelling units are 150 square feet for one person. Um, if it's a sleeping room, which is different from a dwelling unit, it can be 70 square feet for the first occupant and then 50 square feet for the additional person, but that's a sleeping room. So if it's 250 square feet, you're still taking into account that 120 square feet, you're folding that in to the 250. So I hope that answers the question, but um, if Mr. Mora wants to jump in. Um, I, think, I think his question was, was more about when does that visitor be count towards the the number of people in the unit. And I think it's when they sign the lease. I I don't think it's, uh, I, I'm speculating. I don't think it's if they're staying there for a couple of days, but I think it's, they have to be, uh, you know, on the lease or take residence, I think. Mr. Warren, tell me if I'm wrong. I might very well be. Yeah, I mean, the, the way the code reads, it says living or sleeping in the unit. It, you know, is is an occupant, and what uh, Ms. Williams just read off are the numbers for occupants per occupant. So, you know, I mean, we are we are trying in situations where there's a question about the number of people in a unit, we're looking for the hazard. We're looking for you know the harm that could occur by having too many individuals in a unit. Uh, I think for an overnight stay occasionally in a unit like this, we're not going to be too concerned. You know, you've got really easy access to grade a building with a sprinkler system and a fire alarm. That's typically not going to be something we're, you know, trying to, you know, regulate so strictly. But I think the, uh, what needs to be clear in the conditions of the permit based on the square footage is what are the number of occupants that should be, uh, you know, signing that lease and offered the unit for rent. Uh, and, you know, case by case, we would, we would deal with, you know, the issues that would come up by having guests in the unit. And that's helpful. Thank you. And the last question I have, Mr. Shumway, is since you've owned this property for a while and in the winter, it's really tough to get up that east pleasant drive in fact it's closed uh, I, from what i've heard has the fire department taken a look at uh, has there been any need for the fire department to come there can they get up can they get around the can they get a truck around from the north pleasant entrance down to around to the back do they need to i guess number one number two and if they need to can they get around and and uh, have a truck that is on site for a fire yeah, that's 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 actually a good question. We've uh, again, we've never had a first of all the snow. We do that intentionally. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it's a kind of obvious common sense that uh, half the time you can't get up it depending right. on the snow, but it's the going down and sliding into the street that is the issue, right? So we yeah. do that by design. Um, as far as the fire trucks are concerned, I I do know we have uh, the big garbage trucks can make it around. So I'm sort of making that assumption that they have been in and around there. We've been inspected, you know, forever, and uh, either they don't need to because they have equipment they can get to the other side, or it gets by there without any problem. So we've we've met all the inspections, and of course now the sprinkler system is even better. Uh, but I, I I'm only assuming this because I I can't say that I've been on site during an inspection, but I know that everything has been fine. Mr. Moore, do we need to ask the fire department for an opinion or is it already established? I, I actually spoke about this project with Assistant uh, Chief Jeff Olmstead yesterday. Um, there are no concerns that he raised about access, uh, maneuverability to the site. Uh, we were talking about the fire alarm, so he has very, you know, he has very technical questions about the operation and notification of the fire alarm that you know we're discussing but 
uh, you know, he, he did not have uh, any concerns about this project. And I, you know, spoke to him about it going in front of the board this evening and asked him if he had anything he'd like me to share and he didn't. That's, well, that's good enough for me then. Good. All right, if there are any other questions before we move to the public comment? And um, I know, Ms. Rizwana, I, uh, you had your hand up, you wanted to say something yeah. and I call upon you first. Okay, thank you so much. It was wonderful uh, listening to the project. I'm really excited about that. Uh, the fact that I know that area is very uh, integral in that uh, place, uh, there's a lot of vegetation also. From the perspective of environment, are there any trees going to be replaced? Because there was a mention of clearing up the trees or something. So I'm more interested in uh, the environment, if uh, that can be clarified. They're removing it, replacing it, or so on. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Williams, do we have anybody else with their hand up? I don't see anybody. I don't see any hands. Oh, wait, no. Oh, oh there was one that's been up, yeah. <laughs> There we um, go. Yes, hold on. Mr. or Ms. Tova Kamals. One second. There they go. Okay. All right. All right. Please give us your name and address for the record. Uh, there you go. Oh, here. Um, I live, my name is Tova Kemlars, and I live on 138 East Pleasant Street, which is a couple of houses away from the project. Um, my biggest concern is traffic, the way uh, towards East Pleasant Street. Uh, the plan that was uh, presented uh, was lack of uh, the new roundabout that has been there for a couple of years already and uh, didn't show uh, how the circulation of the traffic is, is going and uh, the, the road that is going to East Pleasant Street from the project is... Uh, extremely steep. I wonder what, if anybody measured the slope, if the transportation department can take a look and, and, and because I walk there every day, I, I see it during all the seasons and um, people, when there is a lot of traffic now near the roundabout, uh, coming from both directions, North Pleasant and East Pleasant, and um, people take shortcut if they see that it's too much traffic in one of the the major uh, arteries. So, um, and then uh, almost across of it, there is Bank of America Road that uh, uh, people exit really in a rough way to they cut to the roundabout. So. It can be a big mess, especially because it's so steep. I don't know the angle, seriously. And uh, I don't think it's legal that it's a short road and even it's a driveway, but still, I don't think it should be maybe for emergency or maybe they should change the slope. Uh, and one more thing. All those guests that you mentioned before, um, it will be other guests and they will park on the side of, of the road on East Pleasant and North Pleasant uh, when they go to the bars uh, with their friends and then they go to sleep with them uh, because they don't wanna walk after they drink. And uh, I have my own experience, which is uh, my next door neighbor, um, it's a company that renting to students and they constantly have people that just come park the cars because we're near downtown. 
they go together to the bar, they they block Chestnut and East Pleasant intersection and 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 uh, the pavement and the bike lane, and they they move the cars whenever they want. Nobody's doing nothing. The police, nobody. There is no inspection. So, I think. Uh, it should be examined um, with the uh, traffic, with the transportation department, because it it uh, it it will affect the the round the the location of the roundabout. I think it was purposely they didn't show that it's next to the roundabout. They they showed an old map, the university lodge with an old map. So. And um, I think that's it. Okay. Well, thank you, Mrs. Ms. Clark Camlars, right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if there are no other public comments, this is an opportunity for the uh, applicant to respond to the public comment. If you sure. wish. So maybe Kurt, I'll, I'm going to talk first just about the traffic. I'm going to show an updated map and then I'll ask you to talk about the vegetation uh, to address Rizwana's comment. So what I was showing as a map was just the map from the Amherst GIS system. Uh, obviously, uh, I shouldn't say obviously, I'll say no, absolutely no intent not to show a roundabout for any nefarious reasons. It just wasn't on the Amherst map. So this is where the roundabout is. Here is the University Lodge. Here is the access onto East Pleasant Street. And then here is the access onto North Pleasant Street. Um, you know, I think what I would say is you have to consider the use that it is existing, which is the lodge, which is transient. And you have folks who have potentially never been to this area before, maybe visiting friends, may just want to stay a night or a weekend at the lodge on the one hand. And so they may not know traffic patterns, walking patterns, uh, roadways. What this is turning into is this is going to be people's homes and they're going to know the time of the day to leave. They're going to understand when school buses go by. They're going to know when there's a, a large contingent of folks walking down the street or when the traffic is bad because they're trying to get the class. So it's just, it's just uh, different in, in kind, not even degree. Um, and so I think with that, uh, just comes should be, should come a level of comfort as far as traffic patterns, traffic circulation. And if anything, you probably have less occupants uh, and more stable occupants in this new uh, use than you do in the existing use. And Kurt, I'll turn it over to you for the vegetation discussion. Yeah, um, the 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 one the, the one thing that was mentioned that is would be a terrific concern of mine is that you know using it as a cut through. Um, I'm not sure I would have the answer as to how to control that, but I'm, I'm sure it's been happening in the past. We have other properties that people cut through, cut, cut through Howard Johnson to get to Staples, and and we don't like that. But we're not, we haven't figured out how to control that. Um, I'm not sure I have that control. Other than ultimately, if it was so bad, we could we could actually shut this uh, side down. Uh, as of now, I don't think that's a a necessary. Uh, result, but as far as the the, the trees, uh, my goal is to keep it quite private, um, keeping it um, well maintained, manicured. There's some trees right now that got blown down. We we've uh, uh, we've got a tree guy ready to go in. I think uh, Monday or Tuesday of next week. Wanted to kind of get through this meeting first and um, just do some. Trimming, but the, the the goal would be to keep it, you know any dangerous trees that could be falling one way or the other. We'd like to to, to clean those up and keep it very private and uh, as quaint, if we can use that word, as a as a site as possible. Um, the other the other uh, you, you know you'll see some by the uh, the connecting driveway. There's some beds there, some flower beds and. Some pretty bad concrete that needs to be that'll be all, all fixed up and repaired. We'll be putting in some flowers and plantings there and things like that. We want to just kind of keep it nice and quaint, a little New Englandy looking and um, sort of a value added to the community and keeping it quiet. The, 
the number of people with, is without question. It's not even, I mean, it's, it's light years better than what it was as a use before. Um, we had Craig's doors there for two to three years. And our neighbors said there are fewer complaints with them than when we had the lodge, which was just a, an amazing learning experience for me. And I'm sure many of you in the town who, who, who watched and participated in that process. Um, but we managed pretty carefully. We're not on site 24-7 uh, the way they were. Um, but we don't have the same kind of uh, occupant uh, challenges either. So we're, we're expecting it to be uh, and hoping it to be a very quiet it's not going to be without an occasional issue. I'm not going to suggest that, but uh, we feel pretty good that we can control things. As far as the size of the units would go, um, I would love to try to walk away tonight knowing that we have uh, an approval and be willing to accommodate the square footage. I, I've never heard of that requirement before, so it's not. It, it's kind of new to me, and I'm the one that should be knowing the size of those units, and I don't, so I'm uh, sorry for that. Um, I don't have a problem if the square footage mandates that we can only have one person. Um, I, I just feel that that's going to be the demand for the units because they're just not huge. So if the math says, and if we could put that into some sort of an approval, if the math says it's only one person, I can live with that. I'm pretty confident the downstairs units would be two. And as Tom mentioned earlier, I kind of talked with him a little bit. I said, if I have, if there's a couple there, and they all of a sudden end up and they have a third person, a child, uh, I think there's a lot of laws that might keep me from uh, kicking them out. So I think that would need to be a uh, consideration for that. But we feel pretty confident in, in, in who we're going to be uh, residing here. And if if the uh, the math says we can only have one, I'm comfortable with, with that. If the math says one and a half, I'll go with that. Thank you, Mr. Shumway. Um, we're, I'd like to propose that we take a look at um, coming back as soon as possible, because I think I'd, li I'd like to have the knowledge about the 150, and I really appreciate your uh, willingness to, uh, I think you need to, um, address the size of the rooms and have the lease, uh, including the number of people um, that are allowed in each unit um, delineated in the lease. I think I'd, I'd like to see a site plan that has the, uh, the placement of the um, waste area where the trash is going to be. That's, that's normal, what we normally see. We know where the, where the waste would be. I think having a, a, getting the cut sheets for what, what kind of lights you're going to use is simple. Um, that could come back quickly to us. I think that um, I love the idea of EV charging stations. If you're going to do that, it makes sense. I also think if you have the um, parking lot, uh, I think you have to, I, would, I want to make sure that you have sufficient space for the parking spaces, that they're, they meet the eight feet wide and the, and the handicap, or I think are eight or wider, 10 or 15 feet. And I think you, it should be delineated on a piece of paper, on a plan. We normally see that. Um, what other, I think those are the basic questions. And I think, uh, you know, I think this project is the kind of thing that, that makes a lot of sense. But I think those are questions that we have a responsibility to have answers to before we approve the project. And so Mr. Shumway, I'm not, I know that's not what you want to hear, but I think we're doing our due diligence to make sure. And I think we're giving you the indication from everything I hear that this project is an improvement in the neighborhood, but we just need to know a few more things before we bless it and send it on its way. Fair enough. Can I ask one question? Actually, sure. I would like your opinion. Um, we yep. talked about the location of the dumpster. Um, as I had mentioned, if if I come back, I, I really have uh, the East Pleasant side. Uh, yeah, Tom, move that north right there. That That's where I would be trying to hide a dumpster there. Mm -hmm. um, if I put the dumpster there, is the board okay with that? You know, I, I, I don't think it's a bad place. Um, I think it just has to be shielded. I mean, that's, is that where it is currently? That's where it's been. And, and, I, and I said earlier, and this is, I, I'm 
being completely yeah. honest, you know, clear with you as far as I'm not sure that's the best place. If 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 you take a look at the resident that's going to be living right there, I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure I would want that there. Oh. Um, I'm not sure we're here trying to make every tenant perfectly happy. Uh, that would be nice. But the next location that I can see would be in the lower lot. If we go, yeah, down there, um, it would possibly steal a parking space. Um, it's it's further away. However, my concern there is it becomes a little bit more visible to the church in that area and down a little close. It, so it's a little more visible, and I don't kind of like that. But if I were a resident, it's a little further away to walk to throw out the garbage as well. I, I don't think that's a huge issue. I think what I would love to try to say is go back up to where it was before, Tom. I, I'm going to try to show it to you there. And if my tenants have a problem or if we find that we just aren't serving the tenants properly, would you allow me to move it back down below? So to answer your question, first off, I'm not going to tell you where to put your, your trash thing unless it's really offensive. And I think both of those are have pluses and minuses. And so either one, is, I think it's fine. Okay. Or may, other members may have a, a different opinion. And so you, you come back and show us where you want to have it. I think that also, if you modify the place where you move, move it, you, you need to come back to the, to the building commissioner and say, this is a, a, cha a minor change. And he can view it and say to us, you know, I think this is a minor change. I don't think you need to, to uh, um, go back before the ZBA. Or, he, or perhaps you can draft a condition that said, it's up there. If they decide to move it down to the lower lot, um, there's no need to get a, a pub, have a public hearing. It can be decided. Yeah. Well, I, I just we have can figure out a way around that. Yeah. I'm just. I just want to kind of because yeah. as a lodge, you know, you're having people there for one or two nights, so right. you know, no, no one says much. But if you have somebody who's living there, um, it means a little bit more to them, and it would mean more to me and probably you. So I guess I'm being a little bit. I'm trying to think forward of some of the issues sure. that we have as as landlords. Yep, I understand, and, and I you know, I appreciate your, th your thoughtfulness about the, the unpleasantness of looking out your window and seeing a dumpster. So, screening is what is is a good thing, um, and then we work for the church too to you know screening. So either one, you you decide. That's you know that's I don't want right. to. We can come back with you with all these conditions yep. quite quickly. Yep. Uh, we're a little behind on our on our construction work, but uh, if we can come back in, is there a possibility to come back in in August? Is there another meeting? Um, I think there, Miss Brestrup. I think there is, isn't there? Do we have to? There's a meeting in August on the twenty second, but I'll tell you what it has on it already. It has Jonathan Murray coming and giving you a uh, talk about the legal aspects of solar development, and um, then it has um, a special permit application for one sixty one Chestnut Avenue, which is a two-family, a non-owner-occupied two-family public hearing. So those two items are on that agenda. Um, but it sounds like this may yeah. be relatively quick if Mr. Shumway and Mr. Reedy bring back the information that you're looking for. Um, you may be able to resolve this in, say, a half hour or so. I think we could. That would be so, great. I greatly yeah. appreciate it. I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to expedite the consideration of this as much as possible. Because I, I have no reason to, I don't oppose this project. So you want to do mind. that on the 22nd? Let's think about the 22nd. Yep. Can the members, uh, take a quick poll, can the members on the panel attend a meeting on August 22nd? Yes. All right. Yeah. Yes, I can. I'm available. Mr. Henry, how about you? I'm available. Okay, I'm, I just better check before I. Yep, I'm. I'm good. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. That's terrific. All right. So, um, anybody else have any suggestions for the applicant that you'd like to see when they come back on the twenty second? Uh, Chair Judge, I just wanted to um, ask if the proposed conditions that we sort of drafted—I think there's about twenty-three in all. Um, 
and I think a few more now that I've added to them as we've gone through this meeting, if we can just share that with uh, attorney Reedy and his applicant, that way <laughs> they know exactly what we're looking for. I think that would help expedite the process as well. I think it's a great idea. Okay. Yep. And Good. Mr. Judge, can I just run through the list just to make sure we've got what we have to provide? Yep. Okay, so lighting, show it on the site plan uh, and the dark sky compliant cut sheets. Yep. Trash, show it on the plan. Uh, in addition to what I would think is screening and any, I'll say cut sheet if there's gonna be a fence or some uh, yep. dumpster enclosure. Uh, modify the lease in accordance with the discussion to specifically address the guests uh, allowed overnight uh, duration and number, and then the parking, you know, one per unit instead of one per person. Uh, dimensions of the studio and one bedrooms, uh, as that impacts uh, occupancy as well. And then uh, the dimensions of the parking and location and dimensions of the ADA spaces. And then, you know, Mr. Shumway, if he's thinking about EV, where does that go? But that's, that's the list I had. Did I miss anything or is that? Okay. Uh, I think that is there another one, Ms. Preston? You'll you'll see that the list will expand a little bit, Attorney Reedy, as you see this list of conditions. Okay. So, Thank for you. example, with the EVs, um, that might change or offset his parking count, um, just depending on the requirements. Okay. Can I can I ask? There was a what the way Tom read the parking. I think Tom said one. My 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 hope would be one per unit with the discretion of more if we decide that we want to allow that it's right up until yeah. right just we're not going to be allowing more parking than we have parking spaces we can i can i can live with that that's sort of an obvious well maybe it's not an obvious but that's how we would manage it um so I, however tom phrased it caught my attention Okay. And you're going to need more than one parking space for the two bedrooms. So, yeah. Uh, maybe, but again, maybe, and maybe yeah. not. And again, we have, we have many circumstances where we do not allow three cars for a three bedroom apartment. We, we manage, we, we manage that quite tightly. So I just okay. want to have the flexibility to be able to utilize all my spaces. You got it. Okay. That I don't have anything else to add to the list for the 22nd. Does anybody else? If not, I'd entertain a motion that we continue this um, meeting until August 22nd. We would we do that after the uh, solar presentation. So it'd be around, I'm guessing, seven o'clock to 7.30. Do I have such a motion? Mr. Sloboder moves. Is there a second? Mr. Barner seconds. Any discussion on the motion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to continue this until August 22nd at around 7.30. Um, the chair votes aye. Mr. Barner. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Sloboder. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Vote is five to nothing to, con to continue this in public hearing until August 22nd. All right, thank you. Uh, thank we'll you see you then. Thank much. you guys. Bye -bye. Uh, next order of business is public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. This is where the public has an opportunity to comment on anything except those issues before us. If you wish to comment, please give us your name and address for the record. No public comment. Um, next is any matters not brought up and not uh, listed in the last 48 hours, any new business. And I think the only one we really need to talk about is the schedule for the for August and the first part of September, Ms. Brestrup. Can you just run through that again? So the next meeting is August 22nd, and you have Jonathan Murray from KP Law coming to talk about the legal aspects of solar. And you have 161 Chestnut Avenue. Um, 
a non-owner occupied two family coming before you for a special permit. And now you have <clears throat> this university lodge added to that. And then on August 29th, you have um, the Wayfinders Comprehensive Permit. Um, that will be the first session of the public hearing at which you will be voting on um, Safe Harbor. Mm -hmm. and also hearing an introduction to the project and perhaps um, hearing more specifics about one or the others of the sites. And then you have September 12th. There might be another date before September 12th. Miss Jacinta, do you know, um, I don't have the ZB. Oh, yes, I do. I don't have anything for the 5th. I see the 12th on my calendar. The 12th, um, we have... Shootsbury Road Solar. Yeah. And then um, we don't have anything for the 26th of September yet. And then you have the 10th of October. Um, the Jonathan Clate is coming back to talk to you about Redgate Lane. Mm -hmm. That was continued from July 11th. And one of you can't be there that night. I think it's Mr. Sloviter. Not available. Um, and then you have uh, October 24th, and Mr. Judge is not available. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. But we don't have anything scheduled for then. Um, I don't know what the Wayfinders schedule is. Uh, I don't have that at hand right now, but I think uh, Ms. Williams sent it out, didn't she? Yep. Yeah, she did. I I have a note on my calendar that there's that there's something on the 19th of September for Wayfinders. Yeah, it's I a do full too. Wayfinders meeting. Yeah, yeah, you wayfinders. skipped, you yeah, skipped over the 19th of September. So that's in a different category in my, my <laughs> mind. Um, and I think that Ms. Williams sent out a list of all of the meetings for um for Wayfinders. Actually, I have it right in front of me. Yes. September 19th is one of the dates. October 10th, October 17th, November 14th. Yeah. I, I don't really need to go on and on, but um, you should let Miss Williams know if you're not available for one of those dates um, for the Wayfinders. And I think everyone here, plus Mr. White and minus Mr. Varner would be on that panel, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Yep. So if and, just, and I just I just remind everybody that you can only miss one. Right? right. Yep. So I I did not hear the twenty sixth of September. So for the record, I will not be available on the twenty sixth of September. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right, everybody. I think that wraps everything up unless somebody has some. Mr. Sloboda. This has little to do with this board, but it does have to do with email. My, my email account apparently has been hacked. So if you, if any of you receive an invitation, an, an evite to an elegant dinner is the sucker line that I'm inviting you to an elegant dinner at some point in the near future, beginning at four o'clock and, and open the invitation. Don't. They're looking to get your email address. It's a phony electronic invitation. I don't know how they got to me. I guess I'm just special. But there you are. <laughs> so if you think I've invited you to a party, I haven't. <laughs> you're, you're so you're disappointed. Just, yeah, I you're know. disappointing Some, all of us. We're going to have a great wrote, time on your dime. <laughs> someone wrote to me saying, I can't open the invitation. And it's a bummer. I was looking forward to it. So, <laughs> yeah, well, it doesn't exist. All right. All right, so I'm just warning everybody because one way or another, your emails are in my email. Great. There, there you are. All right. Well, we've reached 9.03. Um, time for us to put this to bed. Um, 
I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Is there a second? A second. Yep. All right, Mr. Barner, thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. Um, that is a non-debatable motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. Mr. Barner. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all for everything. I appreciate Aye. the hard work. Thank you.